A Collection of Fairy Tales by Hans Christian Andersen The Little Mermaid Far out in the ocean, where the water is as blue as the prettiest cornflower and as clear as crystal, it is very, very deep. So deep, indeed, that no cable could fathom it. Many church steeples piled one upon another would not reach from the ground beneath to the surface of the water above. There dwell the sea king and his subjects. We must not imagine that there is nothing at the bottom of the sea but bare yellow sand. No, indeed. The most singular flowers and plants grow there, the leaves and stems of which are so pliant that the slightest agitation of the water causes them to stir as if they had life. Fishes, both large and small, glide between the branches as birds fly among the trees here upon land. In the deepest spot of all stands the castle of the Sea King. Its walls are built of coral, and the long Gothic windows are of the clearest amber. The roof is formed of shells that open and close as the water flows over them. Their appearance is very beautiful, for in each lies a glittering pearl which would be fit for the diadem of a queen. The Sea King had been a widower for many years, and his aged mother kept house for him. She was a very wise woman, and exceedingly proud of her high birth. On that account, she wore twelve oysters on her tail, while others, also of high rank, were only allowed to wear six. She was, however, deserving of very great praise, especially for her care of the little sea princesses, her granddaughters. They were six beautiful children, but the youngest was the prettiest of them all. Her skin was as clear and delicate as a rose leaf, and her eyes as blue as the deepest sea. But, like all the others, she had no feet, and her body ended in a fish's tail. All day long they played in the great halls of the castle, or among the living flowers that grew out of the walls. The large amber windows were open, and the fish swam in, just as the swallows fly into our houses when we open the windows, excepting that the fishes swam up to the princesses, ate out of their hands, and allowed themselves to be stroked. Outside the castle, there was a beautiful garden, in which grew bright red and dark blue flowers and blossoms like flames of fire. The fruit glittered like gold, and the leaves and stems waved to and fro continually. The earth itself was the finest sand, but blue as the flame of burning sulphur. Over everything lay a peculiar blue radiance, as if it were surrounded by the air from above through which the blue sky shone, instead of the dark depths of the sea. In calm weather, the sun could be seen, looking like a purple flower with the light streaming from the calyx. Each of the young princesses had a little plot of ground in the garden, where she might dig and plant as she pleased. One arranged her flower bed into the form of a whale. Another thought it better to make hers like the figure of a little mermaid. But that of the youngest was round like the sun and contained flowers as red as his rays at sunset. She was a strange child, quiet and thoughtful. And while her sisters would be delighted with the wonderful things which they obtained from the wrecks of vessels, she cared for nothing but her pretty red flowers, like the sun, excepting a beautiful marble statue. It was the representation of a handsome boy, carved out of pure white stone, which had fallen to the bottom of the sea from a wreck. She planted by the statue a rose-colored weeping willow. 
it grew splendidly and very soon hung its fresh branches over the statue, almost down to the blue sands. The shadow had a violet tint and waved to and fro like the branches. It seemed as if the crown of the tree and the root were at play and trying to kiss each other. Nothing gave her so much pleasure as to hear about the world above the sea. She made her old grandmother tell her all she knew of the ships and of the towns, the people and the animals. To her, it seemed most wonderful and beautiful to hear that the flowers of the land should have fragrance and not those below the sea, that the trees of the forest should be green and that the fishes among the trees could sing so sweetly that it was quite a pleasure to hear them. Her grandmother called the little birds fishes, or she would not have understood her, for she had never seen birds. When you have reached your fifteenth year, said the grandmother, you will have permission to rise up out of the sea, to sit on the rocks in the moonlight while the great ships are sailing by, and then you will see both forests and towns. In the following year, one of the sisters would be fifteen, but as each was a year younger than the other, the youngest would have to wait five years before her turn came to rise up from the bottom of the ocean and see the earth as we do. However, each promised to tell the others what she saw on her first visit and what she thought the most beautiful, for their grandmother could not tell them enough there were so many things on which they wanted information. None of them longed so much for her turn to come as the youngest, she who had the longest time to wait, and who was so quiet and thoughtful. Many nights she stood by the open window, looking up through the dark blue water and watching the fish as they splashed about with their fins and tails. She could see the moon and stars shining faintly, but through the water they looked larger than they do to our eyes. When something like a black cloud passed between her and them, she knew that it was either a whale swimming over her head or a ship full of human beings who never imagined that a pretty little mermaid was standing beneath them, holding out her white hands towards the keel of their ship. As soon as the eldest was fifteen, she was allowed to rise to the surface of the ocean. When she came back, she had hundreds of things to talk about, but the most beautiful, she said, was to lie in the moonlight on a sandbank in the quiet sea near the coast and to gaze on a large town nearby where the lights were twinkling like hundreds of stars, to listen to the sounds of the music, the noise of carriages, and the voices of human beings, and then to hear the merry bells peal out from the church steeples. And because she could not go near to all those wonderful things, she longed for them more than ever. Oh, did not the youngest sister listen eagerly to all these descriptions? And afterwards, when she stood at the open window looking up through the dark blue water, she thought of the great city with all its bustle and noise, and even fancied she could hear the sound of the church bells down in the depths of the sea. In another year, the second sister received permission to rise to the surface of the water and to swim about where she pleased. She rose just as the sun was setting, and this, she said, was the most beautiful sight of all. The whole sky looked like gold while violet and rose-coloured clouds, which she could not describe, floated over her. And still more rapidly than the clouds, flew a large flock of wild swans towards the setting sun, looking like a long white veil across the sea. She also swam towards the sun, but it sunk into the waves, and the rosy tints faded from the clouds and from the sea. The third sister's turn followed. She was the boldest of them all, and she swam up a broad river that emptied itself into the sea. On the banks, 
she saw green hills covered with beautiful vines. Palaces and castles peeped out from amid the proud trees of the forest. She heard the birds singing, and the rays of the sun were so powerful that she was obliged often to dive down under the water to cool her burning face. In a narrow creek, she found a whole troop of little human children, quite naked and sporting about in the water. She wanted to play with them, but they fled in a great fright. And then, a little black animal came to the water. It was a dog, but she did not know that, for she had never before seen one. This animal barked at her so terribly that she became frightened and rushed back to the open sea. But she said she should never forget the beautiful forest, the green hills, and the pretty little children who could swim in the water, although they had not fish's tails. The fourth sister was more timid. She remained in the midst of the sea, but she said it was quite as beautiful there as nearer the land. She could see for so many miles around her, and the sky above looked like a bell of glass. She had seen the ships, but at such a great distance that they looked like seagulls. The dolphins sported in the waves, and the great whales spouted water from their nostrils till it seemed as if a hundred fountains were playing in every direction. The fifth sister's birthday occurred in the winter, so when her turn came, she saw what the others had not seen the first time they went up. The sea looked quite green, and large icebergs were floating about, each like a pearl, she said, but larger and loftier than the churches built by men. They were of the most singular shapes and glittered like diamonds. She had seated herself upon one of the largest and let the wind play with her long hair, and she remarked that all the ships sailed by rapidly and steered as far away as they could from the iceberg as if they were afraid of it. Towards evening, as the sun went down, dark clouds covered the sky, the thunder rolled, and the lightning flashed, and the red light glowed on the icebergs as they rocked and tossed on the heaving sea. On all the ships, the sails were reefed with fear and trembling, while she sat calmly on the floating iceberg, watching the blue lightning as it darted its forked flashes into the sea. When first the sisters had permission to rise to the surface, they were each delighted with the new and beautiful sights they saw. But now, as grown-up girls, they could go when they pleased, and they had become indifferent about it. They wished themselves back again in the water, and after a month had passed, they said it was much more beautiful down below and pleasanter to be at home. Yet often, in the evening hours, the five sisters would twine their arms round each other and rise to the surface in a row. They had more beautiful voices than any human being could have, and before the approach of a storm and when they expected a ship would be lost, they swam before the vessel and sang sweetly of the delights to be found in the depths of the sea and begging the sailors not to fear if they sank to the bottom. But the sailors could not understand the song, and they took it for the howling of the storm. And these things were never to be beautiful for them, for if the ship sank, the men were drowned, and their dead bodies alone reached the palace of the Sea King. When the sisters rose arm in arm through the water in this way, their youngest sister would stand quite alone, looking after them, ready to cry, only that the mermaids have no tears, and therefore they suffer more. Oh, were I but fifteen years old, said she, I know that I shall love the world up there and all the people who live in it. At last, she reached her fifteenth year. Well, now you are grown up, said the old dowager, her grandmother. So you must let me adorn you like your other sisters. 
and she placed a wreath of white lilies in her hair, and every flower leaf was half a pearl. Then the old lady ordered eight great oysters to attach themselves to the tail of the princess to show her high rank. But they hurt me so, said the little mermaid. Pride must suffer pain, replied the old lady. Oh, how gladly she would have shaken off all this grandeur and laid aside the heavy wreath. The red flowers in her own garden would have suited her much better, but she could not help herself. So she said, Farewell, and rose as lightly as a bubble to the surface of the water. The sun had just set as she raised her head above the waves, but the clouds were tinted with crimson and gold, and through the glimmering twilight beamed the evening star in all its beauty. The sea was calm, and the air mild and fresh. A large ship with three masts lay becalmed on the water, with only one sail set, for not a breeze stiffed, and the sailors sat idle on deck or amongst the rigging. There was music and song on board, and as darkness came on, a hundred coloured lanterns were lighted, as if the flags of all nations waved in the air. The little mermaid swam close to the cabin windows, and now and then, as the waves lifted her up, she could look in through clear glass window panes and see a number of well-dressed people within. Among them was a young prince, the most beautiful of all, with large black eyes. He was sixteen years of age, and his birthday was being kept with much rejoicing. The sailors were dancing on deck, but when the prince came out of the cabin, more than a hundred rockets rose in the air, making it as bright as day. The little mermaid was so startled that she dived underwater, and when she again stretched out her head, it appeared as if all the stars of heaven were falling around her. She had never seen such fireworks before. Great suns spurted fire about, splendid fireflies flew into the blue air, and everything was reflected in the clear, calm sea beneath. The ship itself was so brightly illuminated that all the people and even the smallest rope could be distinctly and plainly seen. And how handsome the young prince looked as he pressed the hands of all present and smiled at them while the music resounded through the clear night air. It was very late, yet the little mermaid could not take her eyes from the ship or from the beautiful prince. The coloured lanterns had been extinguished, no more rockets rose in the air, and the cannon had ceased firing. But the sea became restless, and a moaning, grumbling sound could be heard beneath the waves. Still, the little mermaid remained by the cabin window, rocking up and down on the water, which enabled her to look in. After a while, the sails were quickly unfurled, and the noble ship continued her passage. But soon, the waves rose higher, heavy clouds darkened the sky, and lightning appeared in the distance. A dreadful storm was approaching. Once more, the sails were reefed, and the great ship pursued her flying course over the raging sea. The waves rose mountains high, as if they would have overtopped the mast, but the ship dived like a swan between them, and then rose again on their lofty, foaming crests. To the little mermaid, this appeared pleasant sport. Not so to the sailors. At length, the ship groaned and creaked. The thick planks gave way under the lashing of the sea as it broke over the deck. The main mast snapped asunder like a reed. The ship lay over on her side, and the water rushed in. The little mermaid now perceived that the crew were in danger. Even she herself was obliged to be careful to avoid the beams and planks of the wreck which lay scattered on the water. At one moment, it was so pitch dark that she could not see a single object, but a flash of lightning revealed the whole scene. 
she could see everyone who had been on board, excepting the prince. When the ship parted, she had seen him sink into the deep waves, and she was glad, for she thought he would now be with her. And then she remembered that human beings could not live in the water, so that when he got down to her father's palace, he would be quite dead. But he must not die. So she swam about among the beams and planks which strewed the surface of the sea, forgetting that they could crush her to pieces. Then she dived deeply under the dark waters, rising and falling with the waves, till at length she managed to reach the young prince, who was fast losing the power of swimming in that stormy sea. His limbs were failing him, his beautiful eyes were closed, and he would have died had not the little mermaid come to his assistance. She held his head above the water and let the waves drift them where they would. In the morning, the storm had ceased, but of the ship, not a single fragment could be seen. The sun rose up red and glowing from the water, and its beams brought back the hue of health to the prince's cheeks, but his eyes remained closed. The mermaid kissed his high, smooth forehead and stroked back his wet hair. He seemed to her like the marble statue in her little garden, and she kissed him again and wished that he might live. Presently, they came in sight of land. She saw lofty blue mountains on which the white snow rested as if a flock of swans were lying upon them. Near the coast were beautiful green forests, and close by stood a large building, whether a church or a convent, she could not tell. Orange and citron trees grew in the garden, and before the door stood lofty palms. The sea here formed a little bay, in which the water was quite still, but very deep. So she swam with the handsome prince to the beach, which was covered with fine white sand, and there she laid him in the warm sunshine, taking care to raise his head higher than his body. Then bells sounded in the large white building, and a number of young girls came into the garden. The little mermaid swam out farther from the shore and placed herself between some high rocks that rose out of the water. Then she covered her head and neck with the foam of the sea, so that her little face might not be seen, and watched to see what would become of the poor prince. She did not wait long before she saw a young girl approach the spot where he lay. She seemed frightened at first, but only for a moment. Then she fetched a number of people, and the mermaid saw that the prince came to life again and smiled upon those who stood round him. But to her, he sent no smile. He knew not that she had saved him. This made her very unhappy, and when he was led away into the great building, she dived down sorrowfully into the water and returned to her father's castle. She had always been silent and thoughtful, and now she was more so than ever. Her sisters asked her what she had seen during her first visit to the surface of the water, but she would tell them nothing. Many an evening and morning did she rise to the place where she had left the prince. She saw the fruits in the garden ripen till they were gathered. The snow on the tops of the mountains melt away, but she never saw the prince and therefore she returned home, always more sorrowful than before. It was her only comfort to sit in her own little garden and fling her arm round the beautiful marble statue, which was like the prince. But she gave up tending her flowers, and they grew in wild confusion over the paths, twining their long leaves and stems round the branches of the trees, so that the whole place became dark and gloomy. At length, she could bear it no longer, and told one of her sisters all about it. Then the others heard the secret, and very soon it became known to two mermaids whose intimate friend happened to know who the prince was. 
she had also seen the festival on board ship, and she told them where the prince came from and where his palace stood. Come, little sister, said the other princesses. Then they entwined their arms and rose up in a long row to the surface of the water, close by the spot where they knew the prince's palace stood. It was built of bright yellow, shining stone, with long flights of marble steps, one of which reached quite down to the sea. Splendid gilded cupolas rose over the roof, and between the pillars that surrounded the whole building stood lifelike statues of marble. Through the clear crystal of the lofty windows could be seen noble rooms with costly silk curtains and hangings of tapestry, while the walls were covered with beautiful paintings which were a pleasure to look at. In the center of the largest saloon, a fountain threw its sparkling jets high up into the glass cupola of the ceiling, through which the sun shone down upon the water and upon the beautiful plants growing round the basin of the fountain. Now that she knew where he lived, she spent many an evening and many a night on the water near the palace. She would swim much nearer the shore than any of the others ventured to do. Indeed, once she went quite up the narrow channel under the marble balcony, which threw a broad shadow on the water. Here she would sit and watch the young prince, who thought himself quite alone in the bright moonlight. She saw him many times of an evening, sailing in a pleasant boat, with music playing and flags waving. She peeped out from among the green rushes, and if the wind caught her long, silvery-white veil, those who saw it believed it to be a swan spreading out its wings. On many a night, too, when the fishermen with their torches were out at sea, she heard them relate so many good things about the doings of the young prince that she was glad she had saved his life when he had been tossed about half dead on the waves. And she remembered that his head had rested on her bosom and how heartily she had kissed him. But he knew nothing of all this and could not even dream of her. She grew more and more fond of human beings and wished more and more to be able to wander about with those whose world seemed to be so much larger than her own. They could fly over the sea in ships and mount the high hills which were far above the clouds, and the lands they possessed, their woods and their fields, stretched far away beyond the reach of her sight. There was so much that she wished to know, and her sisters were unable to answer all her questions. Then she applied to her old grandmother, who knew all about the upper world, which she very rightly called the lands above the sea. If human beings are not drowned, asked the little mermaid, can they live forever? Do they never die as we do here in the sea? Yes, replied the old lady. They must also die and their term of life is even shorter than ours. We sometimes live to three hundred years, but when we cease to exist here, we only become the foam on the surface of the water, and we have not even a grave down here of those we love. We have not immortal souls, we shall never live again, but like the green seaweed, when once it has been cut off, we can never flourish more. Human beings, on the contrary, have a soul which lives forever, lives after the body has been turned to dust. It rises up through the clear, pure air beyond the glittering stars. As we rise out of the water and behold all the land of the earth, so do they rise to unknown and glorious regions which we shall never see. Why have not we an immortal soul? asked the little mermaid mournfully. I would give gladly all the hundreds of years that I have to live to be a human being only for one day, and to have the hope of knowing the happiness of that glorious world above the stars. You must not think of that, said the old woman. 
we feel ourselves to be much happier and much better off than human beings. So I shall die, said the little mermaid, and as the foam of the sea, I shall be driven about never again to hear the music of the waves or to see the pretty flowers nor the red sun. Is there anything I can do to win an immortal soul? No, said the old woman, unless a man were to love you so much that you were more to him than his father or mother, and if all his thoughts and all his love were fixed upon you, and the priest placed his right hand in yours, and he promised to be true to you here and hereafter, then his soul would glide into your body, and you would obtain a share in the future happiness of mankind. He would give a soul to you, and retain his own as well. But this can never happen. Your fish's tail, which amongst us is considered so beautiful, is thought on earth to be quite ugly. They do not know any better, and they think it necessary to have two stout props, which they call legs, in order to be handsome. Then the little mermaid sighed and looked sorrowfully at her fish's tail. Let us be happy, said the old lady, and dart and spring about during the three hundred years that we have to live, which is really quite long enough. After that we can rest ourselves all the better. This evening we are going to have a court ball. It is one of those splendid sights which we can never see on earth. The walls and the ceiling of the large ballroom were of thick but transparent crystal. Many hundreds of colossal shells, some of a deep red, others of a grass green, stood on each side in rows with blue fire in them, which lighted up the whole saloon and shone through the walls so that the sea was also illuminated. Innumerable fishes, great and small, swam past the crystal walls. On some of them, the scales glowed with a purple brilliancy, and on others they shone like silver and gold. Through the halls flowed a broad stream, and in it danced the mermen and the mermaids to the music of their own sweet singing. No one on earth has such a lovely voice as theirs. The little mermaid sang more sweetly than them all. The whole court applauded her with hands and tails, and for a moment her heart felt quite gay, for she knew she had the loveliest voice of any on earth or in the sea. But she soon thought again of the world above her, for she could not forget the charming prince, nor her sorrow that she had not an immortal soul like his. Therefore, she crept away silently out of her father's palace, and while everything within was gladness and song, she sat in her own little garden, sorrowful and alone. Then she heard the bugle sounding through the water and thought, He is certainly sailing above, he on whom my wishes depend, and in whose hands I should like to place the happiness of my life. I will venture all for him, and to win an immortal soul while my sisters are dancing in my father's palace, I will go to the sea witch, of whom I have always been so much afraid, but she can give me counsel and help. And then the little mermaid went out from her garden and took the road to the foaming whirlpools behind which the sorceress lived. She had never been that way before. Neither flowers nor grass grew there. Nothing but bare, grey, sandy ground stretched out to the whirlpool, where the water, like foaming mill wheels, whirled round everything that it seized and cast it into the fathomless deep. Through the midst of these crushing whirlpools, the little mermaid was obliged to pass to reach the dominions of the sea witch, and also, for a long distance, the only road lay right across a quantity of warm, bubbling mire, called by the witch her turf moor. Beyond this stood her house, in the centre of a strange forest, 
in which all the trees and flowers were polypi, half animals and half plants. They looked like serpents with a hundred heads growing out of the ground. The branches were long, slimy arms with fingers like flexible worms, moving limb after limb from the root to the top. All that could be reached in the sea, they seized upon and held so fast that it never escaped from their clutches. The little mermaid was so alarmed at what she saw that she stood still and her heart beat with fear, and she was very nearly turning back. But she thought of the prince and of the human soul for which she longed, and her courage returned. She fastened her long, flowing hair round her head so that the polypi might not seize hold of it. She laid her hands together across her bosom, and then she darted forward as a fish shoots through the water between the supple arms and fingers of the ugly polypi, which were stretched out on each side of her. She saw that each held in its grasp something it had seized with its numerous little arms, as if they were iron bands. The white skeletons of human beings who had perished at sea and had sunk down into the deep waters. Skeletons of land animals, oars, rudders, and chests of ships were lying tightly grasped by their clinging arms. Even a little mermaid whom they had caught and strangled. And this seemed the most shocking of all to the little princess. She now came to a space of marshy ground in the wood, where large, fat water snakes were rolling in the mire and showing their ugly, drab-coloured bodies. In the midst of this spot stood a house, built with the bones of shipwrecked human beings. There sat the sea witch, allowing a toad to eat from her mouth, just as people sometimes feed a canary with a piece of sugar. She called the ugly water snakes her little chickens and allowed them to crawl all over her bosom. I know what you want, said the sea witch. It is very stupid of you, but you shall have your way, and it will bring you to sorrow, my pretty princess. You want to get rid of your fish's tail and to have two supports instead of it, like human beings on earth, so that the young prince may fall in love with you and that you may have an immortal soul. And then the witch laughed so loud and disgustingly that the toad and the snakes fell to the ground and lay there wriggling about. You are but just in time, said the witch, for after sunrise tomorrow, I should not be able to help you till the end of another year. I will prepare a draft for you, with which you must swim to land tomorrow before sunrise and sit down on the shore and drink it. Your tail will then disappear and shrink up into what mankind calls legs, and you will feel great pain as if a sword were passing through you. But all who see you will say that you are the prettiest little human being they ever saw. You will still have the same floating gracefulness of movement, and no dancer will ever tread so lightly. But at every step you take, it will feel as if you were treading upon sharp knives and that the blood must flow. If you will bear all this, I will help you. Yes, I will, said the little princess in a trembling voice as she thought of the prince and the immortal soul. But think again, said the witch, for when once your shape has become like a human being, you can no more be a mermaid. You will never return through the water to your sisters or to your father's palace again. And if you do not win the love of the prince so that he is willing to forget his father and mother for your sake, and to love you with his whole soul and allow the priest to join your hands that you may be man and wife, 
then you will never have an immortal soul. The first morning after he marries another, your heart will break, and you will become foam on the crest of the waves. I will do it, said the little mermaid, and she became pale as death. But I must be paid also, said the witch, and it is not a trifle that I ask. You have the sweetest voice of any who dwell here in the depths of the sea, and you believe that you will be able to charm the prince with it also. But this voice you must give to me. The best thing you possess will I have for the price of my draught. My own blood must be mixed with it, that it may be as sharp as a two-edged sword. But if you take my voice away, said the little mermaid, what is left for me? Your beautiful form, your graceful walk, and your expressive eyes. Surely with these you can enchain a man's heart? Well, have you lost your courage? Put out your little tongue that I may cut it off as my payment. Then you shall have the powerful draught. It shall be, said the little mermaid. Then the witch placed her cauldron on the fire to prepare the magic draught. Cleanliness is a good thing, said she, scouring the vessel with snakes which she had tied together in a large knot. Then she pricked herself in the breast and let the black blood drop into it. The steam that rose formed itself into such horrible shapes that no one could look at them without fear. Every moment the witch threw something else into the vessel, and when it began to boil, the sound was like the weeping of a crocodile. When at last the magic draught was ready, it looked like the clearest water. There it is for you, said the witch. Then she cut off the mermaid's tongue so that she became dumb and would never again speak or sing. If the polypi should seize hold of you as you return through the wood, said the witch, throw over them a few drops of the potion and their fingers will be torn into a thousand pieces. But the little mermaid had no occasion to do this, for the polypi sprang back in terror when they caught sight of the glittering draught which shone in her hand like a twinkling star. So she passed quickly through the wood and the marsh and between the rushing whirlpools. She saw that in her father's palace the torches in the ballroom were extinguished and all within asleep. But she did not venture to go into them, for now she was dumb and going to leave them forever. She felt as if her heart would break. She stole into the garden, took a flower from the flower beds of each of her sisters, kissed her hand a thousand times towards the palace, and then rose up through the dark blue waters. The sun had not risen when she came in sight of the prince's palace and approached the beautiful marble steps, but the moon shone clear and bright. Then the little mermaid drank the magic draught, and it seemed as if a two-edged sword went through her delicate body. She fell into a swoon and lay like one dead. When the sun arose and shone over the sea, she recovered and felt a sharp pain. But just before her stood the handsome young prince. He fixed his coal-black eyes upon her so earnestly that she cast down her own and then became aware that her fish's tail was gone and that she had as pretty a pair of white legs and tiny feet as any little maiden could have. But she had no clothes, so she wrapped herself in her long, thick hair. The prince asked her who she was and where she came from, and she looked at him mildly and sorrowfully with her deep blue eyes, but she could not speak. Every step she took 
was as the witch had said it would be. She felt as if treading upon the points of needles or sharp knives, but she bore it willingly and stepped as lightly by the prince's side as a soap bubble, so that he and all who saw her wondered at her graceful swaying movements. She was very soon arrayed in costly robes of silk and muslin, and was the most beautiful creature in the palace. But she was dumb, and could neither speak nor sing. Beautiful female slaves, dressed in silk and gold, stepped forward and sang before the prince and his royal parents. One sang better than all the others, and the prince clapped his hands and smiled at her. This was great sorrow to the little mermaid. She knew how much more sweetly she herself could sing once, and she thought, Oh, if he could only know that, I have given away my voice forever to be with him. The slaves next performed some pretty fairy-like dances to the sound of beautiful music. Then the little mermaid raised her lovely white arms, stood on the tips of her toes, and glided over the floor and danced as no one yet had been able to dance. At each moment, her beauty became more revealed, and her expressive eyes appealed more directly to the heart than the songs of the slaves. Everyone was enchanted, especially the prince, who called her his little foundling, and she danced again quite readily to please him, though each time her foot touched the floor, it seemed as if she trod on sharp knives. The prince said she should remain with him always, and she received permission to sleep at his door on a velvet cushion. He had a page's dress made for her that she might accompany him on horseback. They rode together through the sweet scented woods where the green boughs touched their shoulders and the little birds sang among the fresh leaves. She climbed with the prince to the tops of high mountains, and although her tender feet bled so that even her steps were marked, she only laughed and followed him till they could see the clouds beneath them, looking like a flock of birds traveling to distant lands. While at the prince's palace, and when all the household were asleep, she would go and sit on the broad marble steps, for it eased her burning feet to bathe them in the cold sea water. And then she thought of all those below in the deep. Once during the night, her sisters came up arm in arm, singing sorrowfully as they floated on the water. She beckoned to them, and they recognized her and told her how she had grieved them. After that, they came to the same place every night, and once she saw in the distance her old grandmother, who had not been to the surface of the sea for many years, and the old sea king, her father, with his crown on his head. They stretched out their hands towards her, but they did not venture so near the land as her sisters did. As the days passed, she loved the prince more fondly, and he loved her as he would love a little child. But it never came into his head to make her his wife. Yet, unless he married her, she could not receive an immortal soul. And on the morning after his marriage with another, she would dissolve into the foam of the sea. Do you not love me the best of them all? The eyes of the little mermaid seemed to say when he took her in his arms and kissed her fair forehead. Yes, you are dear to me, said the prince, for you have the best heart, and you are the most devoted to me. You are like a young maiden whom I once saw, but whom I shall never meet again. I was in a ship that was wrecked, and the waves cast me ashore near a holy temple where several young maidens performed the service. The youngest of them found me on the shore and saved my life. I saw her but twice, and she is the only one in the world whom I could love. But you are like her, and you have almost driven her image out of my mind. She belongs to the holy temple, 
and my good fortune has sent you to me instead of her, and we will never part. Ah, he knows not that it was I who saved his life, thought the little mermaid. I carried him over the sea to the wood where the temple stands. I sat beneath the foam and watched till the human beings came to help him. I saw the pretty maiden that he loves better than he loves me. And the mermaid sighed deeply, but she could not shed tears. He says the maiden belongs to the holy temple, therefore she will never return to the world. They will meet no more while I am by his side and see him every day. I will take care of him and love him and give up my life for his sake. Very soon, it was said that the prince must marry and that the beautiful daughter of a neighboring king would be his wife, for a fine ship was being fitted out. Although the prince gave out that he merely intended to pay a visit to the king, it was generally supposed that he really went to see his daughter. A great company were to go with him. The little mermaid smiled and shook her head. She knew the prince's thoughts better than any of the others. I must travel, he had said to her. I must see this beautiful princess. My parents desire it, but they will not oblige me to bring her home as my bride. I cannot love her. She is not like the beautiful maiden in the temple whom you resemble. If I were forced to choose a bride, I would rather choose you, my dumb foundling, with those expressive eyes. And then he kissed her rosy mouth, played with her long, waving hair, and laid his head on her heart, while she dreamed of human happiness and an immortal soul. You are not afraid of the sea, my dumb child said he, as they stood on the deck of the noble ship which was to carry them to the country of the neighboring king. And then he told her of storm and of calm, of strange fishes in the deep beneath them, and of what the divers had seen there. And she smiled at his descriptions, for she knew better than anyone what wonders were at the bottom of the sea. In the moonlight, when all on board were asleep, excepting the man at the helm who was steering, she sat on the deck, gazing down through the clear water. She thought she could distinguish her father's castle, and upon it her aged grandmother, with the silver crown on her head, looking through the rushing tide at the keel of the vessel. Then her sisters came up on the waves and gazed at her mournfully, wringing their white hands. She beckoned to them and smiled, and wanted to tell them how happy and well off she was. But the cabin boy approached, and when her sisters dived down, he thought it was only the foam of the sea which he saw. The next morning, the ship sailed into the harbour of a beautiful town belonging to the king whom the prince was going to visit. The church bells were ringing, and from the high towers sounded a flourish of trumpets, and soldiers with flying colors and glittering bayonets lined the rocks through which they passed. Every day was a festival. Balls and entertainments followed one another. But the princess had not yet appeared. People said that she was being brought up and educated in a religious house where she was learning every royal virtue. At last, she came. Then the little mermaid, who was very anxious to see whether she was really beautiful, was obliged to acknowledge that she had never seen a more perfect vision of beauty. Her skin was delicately fair, and beneath her long, dark eyelashes, her laughing blue eyes shone with truth and purity. It was you, said the prince who saved my life when I lay dead on the beach. And he folded his blushing bride in his arms. Oh, I am too happy, said he to the little mermaid. My fondest hopes are all fulfilled. You will rejoice at my happiness, for your devotion to me is great and sincere. 
the little mermaid kissed his hand and felt as if her heart were already broken. His wedding morning would bring death to her, and she would change into the foam of the sea. All the church bells rung, and the heralds rode about the town proclaiming the betrothal. Perfumed oil was burning in costly silver lamps on every altar. The priests waved the censers, while the bride and bridegroom joined their hands and received the blessing of the bishop. The little mermaid, dressed in silk and gold, held up the bride's train. But her ears heard nothing of the festive music, and her eyes saw not the holy ceremony. She thought of the night of death which was coming to her, and of all she had lost in the world. On the same evening, the bride and bridegroom went on board ship. Cannons were roaring, flags waving, and in the centre of the ship, a costly tent of purple and gold had been erected. It contained elegant couches for the reception of the bridal pair during the night. The ship, with swelling sails and a favourable wind, glided away smoothly and lightly over the calm sea. When it grew dark, a number of coloured lamps were lit, and the sailors danced merrily on the deck. The little mermaid could not help thinking of her first rising out of the sea, when she had seen similar festivities and joys, and she joined in the dance, poised herself in the air as a swallow when he pursues his prey, and all present cheered her with wonder. She had never danced so elegantly before. Her tender feet felt as if cut with sharp knives, but she cared not for it. A sharper pang had pierced through her heart. She knew this was the last evening she should ever see the prince, for whom she had forsaken her kindred and her home. She had given up her beautiful voice and suffered unheard of pain daily for him, while he knew nothing of it. This was the last evening that she would breathe the same air with him, or gaze on the starry sky and the deep sea. An eternal night, without a thought or a dream, awaited her. She had no soul, and now she could never win one. All was joy and gaiety on board ship till long after midnight. She laughed and danced with the rest, while the thoughts of death were in her heart. The prince kissed his beautiful bride while she played with his raven hair, till they went arm in arm to rest in the splendid tent. Then all became still on board the ship. The helmsman, alone awake, stood at the helm. The little mermaid leaned her white arms on the edge of the vessel and looked towards the east for the first blush of morning, for that first ray of dawn that would bring her death. She saw her sisters rising out of the flood. They were as pale as herself, but their long, beautiful hair waved no more in the wind and had been cut off. We have given our hair to the witch, said they, to obtain help for you, that you may not die tonight. She has given us a knife. Here it is. See, it is very sharp. Before the sun rises, you must plunge it into the heart of the prince. When the warm blood falls upon your feet, they will grow together again and form into a fish's tail, and you will be once more a mermaid, and return to us to live out your three hundred years before you die and change into the salt sea foam. Haste then, he or you must die before sunrise. Our old grandmother moans so for you that her white hair is falling off from sorrow, as ours fell under the witch's scissors. Kill the prince and come back. Hasten! Do you not see the first red streaks in the sky? In a few minutes, the sun will rise and you must die. And then they sighed deeply and mournfully and sank down beneath the waves. The little mermaid drew back the crimson curtain of the tent and beheld the fair bride with her head resting on the prince's breast. She bent down and kissed his fair brow. 
then looked at the sky, on which the rosy dawn grew brighter and brighter. Then she glanced at the sharp knife, and again fixed her eyes on the prince, who whispered the name of his bride in his dreams. She was in his thoughts, and the knife trembled in the hand of the little mermaid. Then she flung it far away from her into the waves. The water turned red where it fell, and the drops that spurted up looked like blood. She cast one more lingering, half-fainting glance at the prince, and then threw herself from the ship into the sea, and thought her body was dissolving into foam. The sun rose above the waves, and his warm rays fell on the cold foam of the little mermaid, who did not feel as if she was dying. She saw the bright sun, and all around her floated hundreds of transparent, beautiful beings. She could see through them the white sails of the ship and the red clouds in the sky. Their speech was melodious, but too ethereal to be heard by mortal ears, as they were also unseen by mortal eyes. The little mermaid perceived that she had a body like theirs, and that she continued to rise higher and higher out of the foam. Where am I? asked she, and her voice sounded ethereal, as the voice of those who were with her. No earthly music could imitate it. Among the daughters of the air, answered one of them, a mermaid has not an immortal soul, nor can she obtain one unless she wins the love of a human being. On the power of another hangs her eternal destiny. But the daughters of the air, although they do not possess an immortal soul, can, by their good deeds, procure one for themselves. We fly to warm countries and cool the sultry air that destroys mankind with the pestilence. We carry the perfume of the flowers to spread health and restoration. After we have striven for three hundred years to all the good in our power, we receive an immortal soul and take part in the happiness of mankind. You, poor little mermaid, have tried with your whole heart to do as we are doing. You have suffered and endured and raised yourself to the spirit world by your good deeds. And now, by striving for three hundred years in the same way, you may obtain an immortal soul. The little mermaid lifted her glorified eyes towards the sun and felt them for the first time filling with tears. On the ship in which she had left the prince, there were life and noise. She saw him and his beautiful bride searching for her. Sorrowfully, they gazed at the pearly foam, as if they knew she had thrown herself into the waves. Unseen, she kissed the forehead of her bride and fanned the prince, and then mounted with the other children of the air to a rosy cloud that floated through the ether. After three hundred years, thus shall we float into the kingdom of heaven, said she. And we may even get there sooner, whispered one of her companions. Unseen, we can enter the houses of men where there are children, and for every day on which we find a good child who is the joy of his parents and deserves their love, our time of probation is shortened. The child does not know, when we fly through the room, that we smile with joy at his good conduct, for we can count one year less of our three hundred years. But when we see a naughty or a wicked child, we shed tears of sorrow, and for every tear, a day is added to our time of trial. The Princess and the Pea Once upon a time, there was a prince who wanted to marry a princess, but she would have to be a real princess. 
he traveled all over the world to find one, but nowhere could he get what he wanted. There were princesses enough, but it was difficult to find out whether they were real ones. There was always something about them that was not as it should be. So he came home again and was sad, for he would have liked very much to have a real princess. One evening, a terrible storm came on. There was thunder and lightning, and the rain poured down in torrents. Suddenly, a knocking was heard at the city gate, and the old king went to open it. It was a princess standing out there in front of the gate. But, good gracious, what a sight the rain and the wind had made her look. The water ran down from her hair and clothes. It ran down into the toes of her shoes and out again at the heels. And yet, she said that she was a real princess. Well, we'll soon find that out, thought the old queen. But she said nothing, went into the bedroom, took all the bedding off the bedstead, and laid a pea on the bottom. Then she took twenty mattresses and laid them on the pea, and then twenty eiderdown beds on top of the mattresses. On this, the princess had to lie all night. In the morning, she was asked how she had slept. Oh, very badly, said she. I have scarcely closed my eyes all night. Heaven only knows what was in the bed, but I was lying on something hard so that I am black and blue all over my body. It's horrible. Now they knew that she was a real princess because she had felt the pea right through the twenty mattresses and the twenty eiderdown beds. Nobody but a real princess could be as sensitive as that. So the prince took her for his wife, for now he knew that he had a real princess, and the pea was put in the museum, where it may still be seen, if no one has stolen it. There, that is a true story. The Ugly Duckling It was lovely summer weather in the country, and the golden corn, the green oats, and the haystacks piled up in the meadows looked beautiful. The stork, walking about on his long red legs, chattered in the Egyptian language which he had learnt from his mother. The cornfields and meadows were surrounded by large forests, in the midst of which were deep pools. It was, indeed, delightful to walk about in the country. In a sunny spot stood a pleasant old farmhouse, close by a deep river, and from the house down to the waterside grew great burdock leaves, so high that under the tallest of them a little child could stand upright. The spot was as wild as the centre of a thick wood. In this snug retreat sat a duck on her nest, watching for her young brood to hatch. She was beginning to get tired of her task, for the little ones were a long time coming out of their shells, and she seldom had any visitors. The other ducks liked much better to swim about in the river than to climb the slippery banks and sit under a burdock leaf to have a gossip with her. At length, one shell cracked, and then another, and from each egg came a living creature that lifted its head and cried, Peep, peep! Quack, quack, said the mother, and then they all quacked as well as they could, and looked about them on every side at the large green leaves. Their mother allowed them to look as much as they liked, because green is good for the eyes. How large the world is, said the young ducks, when they found how much more room they now had than while they were inside the eggshell. 
do you imagine this is the whole world? Asked the mother. Wait till you have seen the garden. It stretches far beyond that to the parson's field. But I have never ventured to such a distance. Are you all out? She continued, rising. No, I declare the largest egg lies there still. I wonder how long this is to last. I am quite tired of it. And she seated herself again on the nest. Well, how are you getting on? Asked an old duck who paid her a visit. One egg is not hatched yet, said the duck. It will not break. But just look at all the others. Are they not the prettiest little ducklings you ever saw? They are the image of their father, who is so unkind he never comes to see. Let me see the egg that will not break, said the duck. I have no doubt it is a turkey's egg. I was persuaded to hatch some once, and after all my care and trouble with the young ones, they were afraid of the water. I quacked and clucked, but all to no purpose. I could not get them to venture in. Let me look at the egg. Yes, that is a turkey's egg. Take my advice. Leave it where it is and teach the other children to swim. I think I will sit on it a little while longer said the duck. As I have sat so long already, a few days will be nothing. Please yourself, said the old duck, and she went away. At last, the large egg broke, and a young one crept forth, crying, Peep, peep. It was very large and ugly. The duck stared at it and exclaimed, it is very large, and not at all like the others. I wonder if it really is a turkey. We shall soon find it out, however, when we go to the water. It must go in, if I have to push it myself. On the next day, the weather was delightful, and the sun shone brightly on the green burdock leaves. So the mother duck took her young brood down to the water and jumped in with a splash. Quack, quack, cried she. And one after another, the little ducklings jumped in. The water closed over their heads, but they came up again in an instant and swam about quite prettily with their legs paddling under them as easily as possible. And the ugly duckling was also in the water, swimming with them. Oh! said the mother. That is not a turkey. How well he uses his legs, and how upright he holds himself. He is my own child, and he is not so very ugly after all, if you look at him properly. Quack, quack, come with me now. I will take you into grand society and introduce you to the farmyard. But you must keep close to me, or you may be trodden upon. And above all, beware of the cat. When they reached the farmyard, there was a great disturbance. Two families were fighting for an eel's head, which, after all, was carried off by the cat. See, children, that is the way of the world, said the mother duck, wetting her beak, for she would have liked the eel's head herself. Come now, use your legs and let me see how well you can behave. You must bow your heads prettily to that old duck yonder. She is the highest born of them all and has Spanish blood. Therefore, she is well off. Don't you see she has a red flag tied to her leg, which is something very grand and a great honor for a duck. It shows that everyone is anxious not to lose her as she can be recognized by both man and beast. Come now, don't turn your toes. A well-bred duckling spreads his feet wide apart, just like his father and mother, in this way. Now, bend your neck and say, Quack! The ducklings did as they were bid, but the other duck stared and said, 
Look, here comes another brood, as if there were not enough of us already. And what a queer-looking object one of them is. We don't want him here. And then one flew out and bit him in the neck. Let him alone, said the mother. He is not doing any harm. Yes, but he is so big and ugly, said the spiteful duck, and therefore he must be turned out. The others are very pretty children, said the old duck with the rag on her leg. All but that one. I wish his mother could improve him a little. That is impossible, your grace, replied the mother. He is not pretty, but he has a very good disposition and swims as well or even better than the others. I think he will grow up pretty and perhaps be smaller. He has remained too long in the egg and therefore his figure is not properly formed. And then she stroked his neck and smoothed the feathers, saying, It is a drake, and therefore not of so much consequence. I think he will grow up strong and able to take care of himself. The other ducklings are graceful enough, said the old duck. Now make yourself at home, and if you can find an eel's head, you can bring it to me. And so they made themselves comfortable. But the poor duckling, who had crept out of his shell last of all and looked so ugly, was bitten and pushed and made fun of, not only by the ducks, but by all the poultry. He is too big, they all said. And the turkey cock, who had been born into the world with spurs and fancied himself really an emperor, puffed himself out like a vessel in full sail and flew at the duckling, and became quite red in the head with passion, so that the poor little thing did not know where to go, and was quite miserable, because he was so ugly and laughed at by the whole farmyard. So it went on from day to day, till it got worse and worse. The poor duckling was driven about by everyone. Even his brothers and sisters were unkind to him, and would say, Ah, oh, you ugly creature, I wish the cat would get you. And his mother said she wished he had never been born. The ducks pecked him, the chickens beat him, and the girl who fed the poultry kicked him with her feet. So at last he ran away, frightening the little birds in the hedge as he flew over the palings. They are afraid of me because I am ugly, he said. So he closed his eyes and flew still farther, until he came out on a large moor inhabited by wild ducks. Here he remained the whole night, feeling very tired and sorrowful. In the morning, when the wild ducks rose in the air, they stared at their new comrade. What sort of a duck are you? They all said, coming round him. He bowed to them and was as polite as he could be, but he did not reply to their question. You are exceedingly ugly, said the wild ducks, but that will not matter if you do not want to marry one of our family. Poor thing, he had no thoughts of marriage. All he wanted was permission to lie among the rushes and drink some of the water on the moor. After he had been on the moor two days, there came two wild geese, or rather goslings, for they had not been out of the egg long and were very saucy. Listen, friend, said one of them to the duckling, you are so ugly that we like you very well. Will you go with us and become a bird of passage? Not far from here is another moor in which there are some pretty wild geese all unmarried. It is a chance for you to get a wife. You may be lucky, ugly as you are. Pop, pop, sounded in the air, and the two wild geese fell dead among the rushes, and the water was tinged with blood. Pop, pop, 
echoed far and wide in the distance, and whole flocks of wild geese rose up from the rushes. The sound continued from every direction, for the sportsmen surrounded the moor, and some were even seated on branches of trees overlooking the rushes. The blue smoke from the guns rose like clouds over the dark trees, and as it floated away across the water, a number of sporting dogs bounded in among the rushes, which bent beneath them wherever they went. How they terrified the poor duckling! He turned away his head to hide it under his wing, and at the same moment a large, terrible dog passed quite near him. His jaws were open, his tongue hung from his mouth, and his eyes glared fearfully. He thrust his nose close to the duckling, showing his sharp teeth, and then, splash, splash, he went into the water without touching him. Oh, sighed the duckling, how thankful I am for being so ugly. Even a dog will not bite me. And so he lay quite still, while the shot rattled through the rushes, and gun after gun was fired over him. It was late in the day before all became quiet, but even then, the poor young thing did not dare to move. He waited quietly for several hours, and then, after looking carefully around him, hastened away from the moor as far as he could. He ran over field and meadow till a storm arose, and he could hardly struggle against it. Towards evening, he reached a poor little cottage that seemed ready to fall and only remained standing because it could not decide on which side to fall first. The storm continued so violent that the duckling could not go farther. He sat down by the cottage, and then he noticed that the door was not quite closed in consequence of one of the hinges having given way. There was, therefore, a narrow opening near the bottom, large enough for him to slip through, which he did very quietly, and got a shelter for the night. A woman, a tomcat, and a hen lived in this cottage. The tomcat, whom the mistress called My Little Son, was a great favourite. He could raise his back and purr, and could even throw out sparks from his fur if it was stroked the wrong way. The hen had very short legs, so she was called Chicky Short Legs. She laid good eggs, and her mistress loved her as if she had been her own child. In the morning, the strange visitor was discovered, and the tomcat began to purr, and the hen to cluck. What is that noise about? said the old woman, looking round the room. But her sight was not very good. Therefore, when she saw the duckling, she thought it must be a fat duck that had strayed from home. Oh, what a prize! she exclaimed. I hope it is not a drake, for then I shall have some duck's eggs. I must wait and see. So the duckling was allowed to remain on trial for three weeks but there were no eggs. Now the tomcat was master of the house, and the hen was mistress, and they always said, We and the world, for they believed themselves to be half the world, and the better half too. The duckling thought that others might hold a different opinion on the subject, but the hen would not listen to such doubts. Can you lay eggs? she asked. No. Then have the goodness to hold your tongue. Can you raise your back or purr or throw out sparks? said the tomcat. No. Then you have no right to express an opinion when sensible people are speaking. So the duckling sat in a corner, feeling very low-spirited till the sunshine and the fresh air came into the room through the open door. And then he began to feel such a great longing for a swim on the water that he could not help telling the hen. 
What an absurd idea, said the hen. You have nothing else to do, therefore you have foolish fancies. If you could purr or lay eggs, they would pass away. But it is so delightful to swim about on the water, said the duckling, and so refreshing to feel it close over your head while you dive down to the bottom. Delightful indeed, said the hen. Why, you must be crazy. Ask the cat, he is the cleverest animal I know. Ask him how he would like to swim about on the water, or to dive under it, for I will not speak of my own opinion. Ask our mistress, the old woman. There is no one in the world more clever than she is. Do you think she would like to swim, or to let the water close over her head? You don't understand me said the duckling. We don't understand you. Who can understand you, I wonder? Do you consider yourself more clever than the cat or the old woman? I will say nothing of myself. Don't imagine such nonsense, child, and thank your good fortune that you have been received here. Are you not in a warm room and in society from which you may learn something? But you are a chatterer, and your company is not very agreeable. Believe me, I speak only for your own good. I may tell you unpleasant truths, but that is a proof of my friendship. I advise you, therefore, to lay eggs and learn to purr as quickly as possible. I believe I must go out into the world again, said the duckling. Yes, do, said the hen. So the duckling left the cottage, and soon found water on which it could swim and dive, but was avoided by all other animals because of its ugly appearance. Autumn came, and the leaves in the forest turned to orange and gold. Then, as winter approached, the wind caught them as they fell and whirled them in the cold air. The clouds, heavy with hail and snowflakes, hung low in the sky, and the raven stood on the ferns, crying, Croak! Croak! It made one shiver with cold to look at him. All this was very sad for the poor little duckling. One evening, just as the sun set amid radiant clouds, there came a large flock of beautiful birds out of the bushes. The duckling had never seen any like them before. They were swans, and they curved their graceful necks while their soft plumage shone with dazzling whiteness. They uttered a singular cry as they spread their glorious wings and flew away from those cold regions to warmer countries across the sea. As they mounted higher and higher in the air, the ugly little duckling felt quite a strange sensation as he watched them. He whirled himself in the water like a wheel, stretched out his neck towards them, and uttered a cry so strange that it frightened himself. Could he ever forget those beautiful, happy birds? And when at last they were out of his sight, he dived under the water and rose again almost beside himself with excitement. He knew not the names of these birds, nor where they had flown but he felt towards them as he had never felt for any other bird in the world. He was not envious of these beautiful creatures, but wished to be as lovely as they. Poor, ugly creature! How gladly he would have lived, even with the ducks, had they only given him encouragement. The winter grew colder and colder. He was obliged to swim about on the water to keep it from freezing. But every night, the space on which he swam became smaller and smaller. At length, it froze so hard that the ice in the water crackled as he moved, and the duckling had to paddle with his legs as well as he could to keep the space from closing up. He became exhausted at last and lay still and helpless, frozen fast in the ice. Early in the morning, a peasant 
who was passing by, saw what had happened. He broke the ice in pieces with his wooden shoe and carried the duckling home to his wife. The warmth revived the poor little creature. But when the children wanted to play with him, the duckling thought they would do him some harm. So he started up in terror, fluttered into the milk pan, and splashed the milk about the room. Then the woman clapped her hands, which frightened him still more. He flew first into the butter cask, and then into the meal tub, and out again. What a condition he was in! The woman screamed and struck at him with the tongs. The children laughed and screamed and tumbled over each other in their efforts to catch him. But, luckily, he escaped. The door stood open. The poor creature could just manage to slip out among the bushes and lie down quite exhausted in the newly fallen snow. It would be very sad were I to relate all the misery and privations which the poor little duckling endured during the hard winter. But when it had passed, he found himself lying one morning in a moor amongst the rushes. He felt the warm sun shining and heard the lark singing and saw that all around was beautiful spring. Then the young bird felt that his wings were strong as he flapped them against his sides and rose high into the air. They bore him onwards until he found himself in a large garden before he well knew how it had happened. The apple trees were in full blossom and the fragrant elders bent their long green branches down to the stream which wound round a smooth lawn. Everything looked beautiful in the freshness of early spring. From a thicket close by came three beautiful white swans, rustling their feathers and swimming lightly over the smooth water. The duckling remembered the lovely birds and felt more strangely unhappy than ever. I will fly to those royal birds, he exclaimed, and they will kill me because I am so ugly and dare to approach them. But it does not matter. Better be killed by them than pecked by the ducks, beaten by the hens, pushed about by the maiden who feeds the poultry, or starved with hunger in the winter. Then he flew to the water and swam towards the beautiful swans. The moment they espied the stranger, they rushed to meet him with outstretched wings. Kill me, said the poor bird, and he bent his head down to the surface of the water and awaited death. But what did he see in the clear stream below? His own image, no longer a dark grey bird, ugly and disagreeable to look at, but a graceful and beautiful swan. To be born in a duck's nest in a farmyard is of no consequence to a bird if it is hatched from a swan's egg. He now felt glad at having suffered sorrow and trouble, because it enabled him to enjoy so much better all the pleasure and happiness around him. For the great swan swam round the newcomer and stroked his neck with their beaks as a welcome. Into the garden presently came some little children and threw bread and cake into the water. See? cried the youngest. There is a new one. And the rest were delighted and ran to their father and mother, dancing and clapping their hands and shouting joyously. There is another swan come. A new one has arrived. Then they threw more bread and cake into the water and said, the new one is the most beautiful of all. He is so young and pretty. And the old swans bowed their heads before him. Then he felt quite ashamed and hid his head under his wing, for he did not know what to do. He was so happy and yet not at all proud. He had been persecuted and despised for his ugliness. And now he heard them say, 
he was the most beautiful of all the birds. Even the elder tree bent down its boughs into the water before him, and the sun shone warm and bright. Then he rustled his feathers, curved his slender neck, and cried joyfully from the depths of his heart. I never dreamed of such happiness as this while I was an ugly duckling. The Snow Queen A fairy tale in seven stories. Story the first, which describes a looking glass and the broken fragments. You must attend to the commencement of this story, for when we get to the end, we shall know more than we do now about a very wicked hobgoblin. He was one of the very worst, for he was a real demon. One day, when he was in a merry mood, he made a looking glass, which had the power of making everything good or beautiful that was reflected in it almost shrink to nothing, while everything that was worthless and bad looked increased in size and worse than ever. The most lovely landscapes appeared like boiled spinach, and the people became hideous and looked as if they stood on their heads and had no bodies. Their countenances were so distorted that no one could recognize them, and even one freckle on the face appeared to spread over the whole of the nose and mouth. The demon said this was very amusing. When a good or pious thought passed through the mind of anyone, it was misrepresented in the glass. And then how the demon laughed at his cunning invention. All who went for the demon's school, for he kept a school, talked everywhere of the wonders they had seen, and declared that people could now, for the first time, see what the world and mankind were really like. They carried the glass about everywhere, till at last there was not a land nor a people who had not been looked at through this distorted mirror. They wanted even to fly with it up to heaven to see the angels, but the higher they flew, the more slippery the glass became, and they could scarcely hold it, till at last it slipped from their hands, fell to the earth, and was broken into millions of pieces. But now the looking glass caused more unhappiness than ever, for some of the fragments were not so large as a grain of sand, and they flew about the world into every country. When one of these tiny atoms flew into a person's eye, it stuck there, unknown to him, and from that moment he saw everything through a distorted medium, or could see only the worst side of what he looked at, for even the smallest fragment retained the same power which had belonged to the whole mirror. Some few persons even got a fragment of the looking glass in their hearts, and this was very terrible, for their hearts became cold like a lump of ice. A few of the pieces were so large that they could be used as window panes. It would have been a sad thing to look at our friends through them. Other pieces were made into spectacles. This was dreadful for those who wore them, for they could see nothing either rightly or justly. At all this, the wicked demon laughed till his sides shook. It tickled him so to see the mischief he had done. There were still a number of these little fragments of glass floating about in the air, and now you shall hear what happened with one of them. Story the Second A Little Boy and a Little Girl in a large town, full of houses and people, there is not room for everybody to have even a little garden. Therefore, 
they are obliged to be satisfied with a few flowers in flower pots. In one of these large towns lived two poor children who had a garden something larger and better than a few flower pots. They were not brother and sister, but they loved each other almost as much as if they had been. Their parents lived opposite to each other in two garrets, where the roofs of neighboring houses projected out towards each other, and the water pipe ran between them. In each house was a little window, so that anyone could step across the gutter from one window to the other. The parents of these children had each a large wooden box in which they cultivated kitchen herbs for their own use, and a little rose bush in each box which grew splendidly. Now, after a while, the parents decided to place these two boxes across the water pipe so that they reached from one window to the other and looked like two banks of flowers. Sweet peas drooped over the boxes, and the rose bushes shot forth long branches which were trained round the windows and clustered together almost like a triumphal arch of leaves and flowers. The boxes were very high, and the children knew they must not climb upon them without permission, but they were often, however, allowed to step out together and sit upon their little stools under the rose bushes or play quietly. In winter, all this pleasure came to an end, for the windows were sometimes quite frozen over. But then they would warm copper pennies on the stove and hold the warm pennies against the frozen pane. There would be very soon a little round hole through which they could peep, and the soft, bright eyes of the little boy and girl would beam through the hole at each window as they looked at each other. Their names were Kai and Gerda. In summer, they could be together with one jump from the window, but in winter, they had to go up and down the long staircase and out through the snow before they could meet. See, there are the white bees swarming, said Kai's old grandmother one day when it was snowing. Have they a queen bee? asked the little boy, for he knew that the real bees had a queen. To be sure they have, said the grandmother. She is flying there where the swarm is thickest. She is the largest of them all and never remains on the earth, but flies up to the dark clouds. Often at midnight she flies through the streets of the town and looks in at the windows. Then the ice freezes on the panes into wonderful shapes that look like flowers and castles. Yes, I have seen them said both the children, and they knew it must be true. Can the Snow Queen come in here? asked the little girl. Only let her come, said the boy. I'll set her on the stove, and then she'll melt. Then the grandmother smoothed his hair and told him some more tales. One evening, when little Kai was at home, half undressed, he climbed on a chair by the window and peeped out through the little hole. A few flakes of snow were falling, and one of them, rather larger than the rest, alighted on the edge of one of the flower boxes. This snowflake grew larger and larger, till at last it became the figure of a woman, dressed in garments of white gauze, which looked like millions of starry snowflakes linked together. She was fair and beautiful, but made of ice, shining and glittering ice. Still, she was alive, and her eyes sparkled like bright stars, but there was neither peace nor rest in their glance. She nodded towards the window and waved her hand, the little boy was frightened and sprang from the chair. At the same moment, it seemed as if a large bird flew by the window. On the following day, 
there was a clear frost, and very soon came the spring. The sun shone, the young green leaves burst forth, the swallows built their nests, windows were opened, and the children sat once more in the garden on the roof, high above all the other rooms. How beautiful the roses blossomed this summer. The little girl had learned a hymn in which roses were spoken of, and then she thought of their own roses, and she sang the hymn to the little boy, and he sang too. Roses bloom and cease to be, but we shall the Christ child see. Then the little ones held each other by the hand and kissed the roses and looked at the bright sunshine and spoke to it as if the Christ child were there. Those were splendid summer days. How beautiful and fresh it was out among the rose bushes, which seemed as if they would never leave off blooming. One day, Kai and Gerda sat looking at a book full of pictures of animals and birds. And then, just as the clock in the church tower struck twelve, Kai said, Oh, something has struck my heart. And soon after, there is something in my eye. The little girl put her arm around his neck and looked into his eye, but she could see nothing. I think it is gone, he said. But it was not gone. It was one of those bits of the looking glass, that magic mirror of which we have spoken, the ugly glass which made everything great and good appear small and ugly, while all that was wicked and bad became more visible, and every little fault could be plainly seen. Poor little Kai had also received a small grain in his heart, which very quickly turned to a lump of ice. He felt no more pain, but the glass was there still. Why do you cry? said he at last. It makes you look ugly. There is nothing the matter with me now. Oh, see, he cried suddenly. That rose is worm-eaten and this one is quite crooked. After all, they are ugly roses, just like the box in which they stand. And then he kicked the boxes with his foot and pulled off the two roses. Kai, what are you doing? cried the little girl. And then, when he saw how frightened she was, he tore off another rose and jumped through his own window away from little Gerda. When she afterwards brought out the picture book, he said, It was only fit for babies in long clothes. And when grandmother told any stories, he would interrupt her with, But... Or when he could manage it, he would get behind her chair, put on a pair of spectacles, and imitate her very cleverly to make people laugh. By and by, he began to mimic the speech and gait of persons in the street. All that was peculiar or disagreeable in a person, he would imitate directly. And people said, That boy will be very clever. He has a remarkable genius. But it was the piece of glass in his eye and the coldness in his heart that made him act like this. He would even tease little Gerda, who loved him with all her heart. His games, too, were quite different. They were not so childish. One winter's day, when it snowed, he brought out a burning glass. Then he held out the tail of his blue coat and let the snowflakes fall upon it. Look in this glass, Gerda, said he, and she saw how every flake of snow was magnified and looked like a beautiful flower or a glittering star. Is it not clever? said Kai, and much more interesting than looking at real flowers. There is not a single fault in it, and the snowflakes are quite perfect till they begin to melt. 
soon after, Kai made his appearance in large, thick gloves and with his sledge at his back. He called upstairs to Gerda. I've got to leave to go into the great square where the other boys play and ride. And away he went. In the great square, the boldest among the boys would often tie their sledges to the country people's carts and go with them a good way. This was capital. But while they were all amusing themselves, and Kai with them, a great sledge came by. It was painted white, and in it sat someone wrapped in a rough white fur and wearing a white cap. The sledge drove twice round the square, and Kai fastened his own little sledge to it, so that when it went away, he followed with it. It went faster and faster, right through the next street, and then the person who drove turned round and nodded pleasantly to Kai, just as if they were acquainted with each other. But whenever Kai wished to loosen his little sledge, the driver nodded again, so Kai sat still, and they drove out through the town gate. Then the snow began to fall so heavily that the little boy could not see a hand's breadth before him, but still they drove on. Then he suddenly loosened the cord so that the large sled might go on without him, but it was of no use. His little carriage held fast, and away they went like the wind. Then he called out loudly, but nobody heard him while the snow beat upon him and the sledge flew onwards. Every now and then it gave a jump as if it were going over hedges and ditches. The boy was frightened and tried to say a prayer, but he could remember nothing but the multiplication table. The snowflakes became larger and larger till they appeared like great white chickens. All at once they sprang on one side, the great sledge stopped, and the person who had driven it rose up. The fur and the cap, which were made entirely of snow, fell off, and he saw a lady, tall and white. It was the Snow Queen. We have driven well, said she, but why do you tremble? Here, creep into my warm fur. Then she seated him beside her in the sledge, and as she wrapped the fur round him, he felt as if he was sinking into a snowdrift. Are you still cold? she asked, as she kissed him on the forehead. The kiss was colder than ice. It went quite through to his heart, which was already almost a lump of ice. He felt as if he were going to die, but only for a moment. He soon seemed quite well again and did not notice the cold around him. My sledge! Don't forget my sledge! was his first thought. And then he looked and saw that it was bound fast to one of the white chickens, which flew behind him with the sledge at its back. The Snow Queen kissed little Kai again, and by this time he had forgotten little Gerda, his grandmother, and all at home. Now you must have no more kisses, she said, or I should kiss you to death. Kai looked at her and saw that she was so beautiful he could not imagine a more lovely and intelligent face. She did not now seem to be made of ice, as when he had seen her through his window and she had nodded to him. In his eyes, she was perfect, and he did not feel at all afraid. He told her he could do mental arithmetic as far as fractions, and that he knew the number of square miles and the number of inhabitants in the country. And she always smiled, so that he thought he did not know enough yet, and she looked round the vast expanse as she flew higher and higher with him 
upon a black cloud, while the storm blew and howled as if it were singing old songs. They flew over woods and lakes, over sea and land. Below them roared the wild wind. The wolves howled and the snow crackled. Over them flew the black screaming crows, and above all shone the moon, clear and bright. And so Kai passed through the long winter's night, and by day he slept at the feet of the Snow Queen. Story the Third The Flower Garden of the Woman Who Could Conjure But how fared little Gerda during Kai's absence? What had become of him, no one knew, nor could anyone give the slightest information, excepting the boys, who said that he had tied his sledge to another very large one, which had driven through the street and out at the town gate. Nobody knew where it went. Many tears were shed for him, and little Gerda wept bitterly for a long time. She said she knew he must be dead, that he was drowned in the river which flowed close by the school. Oh, indeed, those long winter days were very dreary. But at last, spring came with warm sunshine. Kai is dead and gone, said little Gerda. I don't believe it, said the sunshine. He is dead and gone, she said to the sparrows. We don't believe it, they replied. And at last, little Gerda began to doubt it herself. I will put on my new red shoes, she said one morning, those that Kai has never seen, and then I will go down to the river and ask for him. It was quite early when she kissed her old grandmother, who was still asleep. Then she put on her red shoes and went quite alone out of the town gates toward the river. Is it true that you have taken my little playmate away from me? said she to the river. I will give you my red shoes if you will give him back to me. And it seemed as if the waves nodded to her in a strange manner. Then she took off her red shoes, which she liked better than anything else, and threw them both into the river. But they fell near the bank, and the little waves carried them back to the land, just as if the river would not take from her what she loved best, because they could not give her back little Kai. But she thought the shoes had not been thrown out far enough, then she crept into a boat that lay among the reeds and threw the shoes again from the farther end of the boat into the water. But it was not fastened, and her movement sent it gliding away from the land. When she saw this, she hastened to reach the end of the boat. But before she could do so, it was more than a yard from the bank and drifting away faster than ever. Then little Gerda was very much frightened and began to cry. But no one heard her except the sparrows, and they could not carry her to land, but they flew along by the shore and sang as if to comfort her. Here we are, here we are. The boat floated with the stream. Little Gerda sat quite still with only her stockings on her feet. The red shoes floated after her, but she could not reach them because the boat kept so much in advance. The banks on each side of the river were very pretty. There were beautiful flowers, old trees, sloping fields in which cows and sheep were grazing, but not a man to be seen. Perhaps the river will carry me to little Kai, thought Gerda and then she became more cheerful and raised her head and looked at the beautiful green banks. And so the boat sailed on for hours. At length she came to a large cherry orchard 
in which stood a small red house with strange red and blue windows. It had also a thatched roof, and outside were two wooden soldiers that presented arms to her as she sailed past. Gerda called out to them, for she thought they were alive, but of course they did not answer. And as the boat drifted nearer to the shore, she saw what they really were. Then Gerda called still louder, and there came a very old woman out of the house, leaning on a crutch. She wore a large hat to shade her from the sun, and on it were painted all sorts of pretty flowers. You poor little child, said the old woman. How did you manage to come all this distance into the wide world on such a rapid rolling stream? And then the old woman walked in the water, seized the boat with her crutch, drew it to land and lifted Gerda out. And Gerda was glad to feel herself on dry ground, although she was rather afraid of the strange old woman. Come and tell me who you are said she, and how came you here? Then Gerda told her everything, while the old woman shook her head and said, Hmm, hmm. And when she had finished, Gerda asked if she had not seen little Kai, and the old woman told her he had not passed by that way, but he very likely would come. So she told Gerda not to be sorrowful, but to taste the cherries and look at the flowers. They were better than any picture book, for each of them could tell a story. Then she took Gerda by the hand and led her into the little house, and the old woman closed the door. The windows were very high, and as the panes were red, blue and yellow, the daylight shone through them in all sorts of singular colours. On the table stood beautiful cherries, and Gerda had permission to eat as many as she would. While she was eating them, the old woman combed out her long flaxen ringlets with a golden comb, and the glossy curls hung down on each side of the little round, pleasant face, which looked fresh and blooming as a rose. I have long been wishing for a dear little maiden like you, said the old woman. And now you must stay with me and see how happily we shall live together. And while she went on combing little Gerda's hair, she thought less and less about her adopted brother Kai, for the old woman could conjure, although she was not a wicked witch. She conjured only a little for her own amusement, and now because she wanted to keep Gerda. Therefore, she went into the garden and stretched out her crutch towards all the rose trees, beautiful though they were, and they immediately sunk into the dark earth so that no one could tell where they had once stood. The old woman was afraid that if little Gerda saw roses, she would think of those at home, and then remember little Kai and run away. Then she took Gerda into the flower garden. How fragrant and beautiful it was! Every flower that could be thought of for every season of the year was here in full bloom. No picture book could have more beautiful colours. Gerda jumped for joy and played till the sun went down behind the tall cherry trees. Then she slept in an elegant bed with red silk pillows embroidered with coloured violets. And then she dreamed as pleasantly as a queen on her wedding day. The next day, and for many days after, Gerda played with the flowers in the warm sunshine. She knew every flower, and yet Although there were so many of them, it seemed as if one were missing. But which it was, she could not tell. One day, however, as she sat looking at the old woman's hat with the painted flowers on it, 
she saw that the prettiest of them all was a rose. The old woman had forgotten to take it from her hat when she made all the roses sink into the earth. But it is difficult to keep the thoughts together in everything. One little mistake upsets all our arrangements. What? Are there no roses here? cried Gerda. And she ran out into the garden and examined all the beds and searched and searched. There was not one to be found. Then she sat down and wept, and her tears fell just on the place where one of the rose trees had sunk down. The warm tears moistened the earth, and the rose tree sprouted up at once, as blooming as when it had sunk. And Gerda embraced it and kissed the roses, and thought of the beautiful roses at home, and with them of little Kai. Oh, how I have been detained, said the little maiden. I wanted to seek for little Kai. Do you know where he is? She asked the roses. Do you think he is dead? And the roses answered, No, he is not dead. We have been in the ground where all the dead lie, but Kai is not there. Thank you said little Gerda, and then she went to the other flowers and looked into their little cups and asked, Do you know where little Kai is? But each flower, as it stood in the sunshine, dreamed only of its own little fairy tale of history. Not one knew anything of Kai. Gerda heard many stories from the flowers as she asked them one after another about him. And what, said the tiger lily? Hark, do you hear the drum? Turn, turn. There are only two notes always. Turn, turn. Listen to the woman's song of mourning. Hear the cry of the priest. In her long red robe stands the Hindu widow by the funeral pile. The flames rise around her as she places herself on the dead body of her husband. But the Hindu woman is thinking of the living one in that circle. Of him, her son, who lighted those flames. Those shining eyes trouble her heart more painfully than the flames which will soon consume her body to ashes. Can the fire of the heart be extinguished in the flames of the funeral pile? I don't understand that at all, said little Gerda. That is my story, said the tiger lily. What says the convolvulus? Near yonder narrow road stands an old knight's castle, Thick ivy creeps over the old ruined walls, leaf over leaf, even to the balcony, in which stands a beautiful maiden. She bends over the balustrades and looks up the road. No rose on its stem is fresher than she. No apple blossom, wafted by the wind, floats more lightly than she moves. Her rich silk rustles as she bends over and exclaims, Will he not come? Is it Kai, you mean? asked Gerda. I am only speaking of a story of my dream, replied the flower. What said the little snowdrop? Between two trees a rope is hanging. There is a piece of board upon it. It is a swing. Two pretty little girls in dresses white as snow and with long green ribbons fluttering from their hats are sitting upon it, swinging. Their brother, who is taller than they are, stands in the swing. He has one arm round the rope to steady himself. In one hand he holds a little bowl, and in the other a clay pipe. He is blowing bubbles. As the swing goes on, the bubbles fly upward, reflecting the most beautiful, varying colours. 
The last still hangs from the bowl of the pipe and sways in the wind. On goes the swing, and then a little black dog comes running up. He is almost as light as the bubble, and he raises himself on his hind legs and wants to be taken into the swing. But it does not stop, and the dog falls. Then he barks and gets angry. The children stoop towards him, and the bubble bursts. A swinging plank, a light, sparkling foam picture. That is my story. It may be all very pretty what you are telling me, said little Gerda. But you speak so mournfully, and you do not mention little Kai at all. What do the hyacinths say? There were three beautiful sisters, fair and delicate. The dress of one was red, of the second blue, and of the third pure white. Hand in hand they danced in the bright moonlight by the calm lake. But they were human beings, not fairy elves. The sweet fragrance attracted them, and they disappeared in the wood. Here the fragrance became stronger. Three coffins, in which lay the three beautiful maidens, glided from the thickest part of the forest across the lake. The fireflies flew lightly over them like little floating torches. Do the dancing maidens sleep, or are they dead? The scent of the flower says that they are corpses. The evening bell tolls their knell. You make me quite sorrowful, said little Gerda. Your perfume is so strong, you make me think of the dead maidens. Oh, is little Kai really dead then? The roses have been in the earth, and they say no. Cling, clang, told the hyacinth bells. We are not tolling for little Kai. We do not know him. We sing our song, the only one we know. Then Gerda went to the buttercups that were glittering amongst the bright green leaves. You are little bright suns, said Gerda. Tell me if you know where I can find my playfellow. And the buttercup sparkled gaily and looked again at Gerda. What song could the buttercup sing? It was not about Kai. The bright warm sun shone on a little court on the first warm day of spring. His bright beams rested on the white walls of the neighboring house, and close by bloomed the first yellow flower of the season, glittering like gold in the sun's warm ray. An old woman sat in her armchair at the house door, and her granddaughter, a poor and pretty servant maid, came to see her for a short visit. When she kissed her grandmother, there was gold everywhere, the gold of the heart in that holy kiss. It was a golden morning. There was gold in the beaming sunlight, gold in the leaves of the lowly flower, and on the lips of the maiden. There, that is my story, said the buttercup. My poor old grandmother, sighed Gerda. She is longing to see me and grieving for me as she did for little Kai. But I shall soon go home now and take little Kai with me. It is no use asking the flowers. They know only their own songs and can give me no information. And then she tucked up her little dress that she might run faster. But the Narcissus caught her by the leg as she was jumping over it. So she stopped and looked at the tall yellow flower and said, Perhaps you may know something. Then she stooped down quite close to the flower and listened. And what did he say? I can see myself. I can see myself, said the Narcissus. Oh, how sweet is my perfume, 
Up in a little room with a bow window stands a little dancing girl, half undressed. She stands sometimes on one leg and sometimes on both and looks as if she would tread the whole world under her feet. She is nothing but a delusion. She is pouring water out of a teapot on a piece of stuff which she holds in her hand. It is a bodice. Cleanliness is a good thing, she says. Her white dress hangs on a peg. It has also been washed in the teapot and dried on the roof. She puts it on and ties a saffron-colored handkerchief round her neck, which makes the dress look whiter. See how she stretches out her legs as if she were showing off on a stem. I can see myself. I can see myself. What do I care for all that? said Gerda. You need not tell me such stuff. And then she ran to the other end of the garden. The door was fastened, but she pressed against the rusty latch and it gave way. The door sprang open and little Gerda ran out with bare feet into the wide world. She looked back three times, but no one seemed to be following her. At last, she could run no longer, so she sat down to rest on a great stone. And when she looked round, she saw that the summer was over, an autumn very far advanced. She had known nothing of this in the beautiful garden where the sun shone and the flowers grew all the year round. Oh, how I have wasted my time, said little Gerda. It is autumn. I must not rest any longer. And she rose up to go on. But her little feet were wounded and sore, and everything around her looked so cold and bleak. The long willow leaves were quite yellow. The dewdrops fell like water. Leaf after leaf dropped from the trees. The slow thorn alone still bore fruit, but the sloes were sour and set the teeth on edge. Oh, how dark and weary the whole world appeared. Story the Fourth The Prince and Princess Gerda was obliged to rest again, and just opposite the place where she sat, she saw a great crow come hopping across the snow toward her. He stood looking at her for some time, and then he wagged his head and said, Caw! Caw! Good day! Good day! He pronounced the words as plainly as he could, because he meant to be kind to the little girl. And then he asked her where she was going, all alone in the wide world. The word alone, Gerda understood very well, and knew how much it expressed. So then she told the crow the whole story of her life and adventures, and asked him if he had seen little Kai. The crow nodded his head very gravely and said, Perhaps I have. It may be. No. Do you think you have? cried little Gerda, and she kissed the crow and hugged him almost to death with joy. Gently, gently, said the crow. I believe I know. I think it may be little Kai, but he has certainly forgotten you by this time for the princess. Does he live with a princess? asked Gerda. Yes, listen, replied the crow. But it is so difficult to speak your language. If you understand the crow's language, then I can explain it better. Do you? No, I have never learnt it, said Gerda. But my grandmother understands it and used to speak it to me. I wish I had learnt it. It does not matter, answered the crow. I will explain as well as I can, although it will be very badly done. And he told her what he had heard. 
In this kingdom where we now are, said he, there lives a princess who is so wonderfully clever that she has read all the newspapers in the world and forgotten them too, although she is so clever. A short time ago, as she was sitting on her throne, which people say is not such an agreeable seat as is often supposed, she began to sing a song which commences in these words. Why should I not be married? Why not indeed? said she. And so she determined to marry if she could find a husband who knew what to say when he was spoken to, and not one who could only look grand, for that was so tiresome. Then she assembled all her court ladies together at the beat of the drum, and when they heard of her intentions, they were very much pleased. We are so glad to hear it, said they. We were talking about it ourselves the other day. You may believe that every word I tell you is true, said the crow, for I have a tame sweetheart who goes freely about the palace, and she told me all this. Of course, his sweetheart was a crow, for birds of a feather flock together, and one crow always chooses another crow. Newspapers were published immediately, with a border of hearts and the initials of the princess among them. They gave notice that every young man who was handsome was free to visit the castle and speak with the princess, and those who could reply loud enough to be heard when spoken to were to make themselves quite at home at the palace. But the one who spoke best would be chosen as a husband for the princess. Yes, yes, you may believe me, it is all as true as I sit here, said the crow. The people came in crowds. There was a great deal of crushing and running about, but no one succeeded either on the first or second day. They could all speak very well while they were outside in the streets, but when they entered the palace gates and saw the guards in silver uniforms and the footmen in their golden livery on the staircase and the great halls lighted up, they became quite confused. And when they stood before the throne on which the princess sat, they could do nothing but repeat the last word she had said, and she had no particular wish to hear her own words over again. It was just as if they had all taken something to make them sleepy while they were in the palace, for they did not recover themselves nor speak till they got back again into the street. There was quite a long line of them reaching from the town gate to the palace. I went myself to see them, said the crow. They were hungry and thirsty, for at the palace they did not even get a glass of water. Some of the wisest had taken a few slices of bread and butter with them, but they did not share it with their neighbours. They thought if they went into the princess looking hungry, there would be a better chance for themselves. But Kai, tell me about little Kai, said Gerda. Was he amongst the crowd? Stop a bit, we're just coming to him. It was on the third day. There came marching cheerfully along to the palace a little personage, without horses or carriage, his eyes sparkling like yours. He had beautiful long hair, but his clothes were very poor. That was Kai, said Gerda joyfully. Oh, then I have found him, and she clapped her hands. He had a little knapsack on his back, added the crow. No, it must have been his sledge, said Gerda, for he went away with it. It may have been so said the crow. I did not look at it very closely, but I know from my tame sweetheart that he passed through the palace gates, saw the guards in their silver uniform and the servants in their liveries of gold on the stairs, but he was not in the least embarrassed. 
It must be very tiresome to stand on the stairs, he said. I prefer to go in. The rooms were blazing with light. Councillors and ambassadors walked about with bare feet, carrying golden vessels. It was enough to make anyone feel serious. His boots creaked loudly as he walked, and yet he was not at all uneasy. It must be Kai, said Gerda. I know he had new boots on. I have heard them creak in Grandmother's room. They really did creak, said the crow. Yet he went boldly up to the princess herself, who was sitting on a pearl as large as a spinning wheel, and all the ladies of the court were present with their maids, and all the cavaliers with their servants, and each of the maids had another maid to wait upon her, and the cavaliers' servants had their own servants, as well as a page each. They all stood in circles round the princess, and the nearer they stood to the door, the prouder they looked. The servants' pages, who always wore slippers, could hardly be looked at. They held themselves up so proudly by the door. It must be quite awful, said little Gerda. But did Kai win the princess? If I had not been a crow, said he, I would have married her myself, although I am engaged. He spoke just as well as I do when I speak the crow's language, so I heard from my tame sweetheart. He was quite free and agreeable, and said he had not come to woo the princess, but to hear her wisdom, and he was as pleased with her as she was with him. Oh, certainly that was Kai, said Gerda. He was so clever, he could work mental arithmetic and fractions. Oh, will you take me to the palace? It is very easy to ask that, replied the crow. But how are we to manage it? However, I will speak about it to my tame sweetheart and ask her advice. For I must tell you, it will be very difficult to gain permission for a little girl like you to enter the palace. Oh yes, but I shall gain permission easily, said Gerda. For when Kai hears that I am here, he will come out and fetch me in immediately. Wait for me here by the palings, said the crow, wagging his head as he flew away. It was late in the evening before the crow returned. Caw, caw, he said. She sends you greeting, and here is a little roll which she took from the kitchen for you. There is plenty of bread there, and she thinks you must be hungry. It is not possible for you to enter the palace by the front entrance. The guards in silver uniform and the servants in gold livery would not allow it. But do not cry, we will manage to get you in. My sweetheart knows a little back staircase that leads to the sleeping apartments, and she knows where to find the key. Then they went into the garden through the great avenue, where the leaves were falling one after another, and they could see the light in the palace being put out in the same manner. And the crow led little Gerda to the back door, which stood ajar. Oh, how little Gerda's heart beat with anxiety and longing. It was just as if she were going to do something wrong, and yet she only wanted to know where little Kai was. It must be him, she thought, with those clear eyes and that long hair. She could fancy she saw him smiling at her, as he used to at home when they sat among the roses. He would certainly be glad to see her and to hear what a long distance she had come for his sake and to know how sorry they had been at home because he did not come back. Oh, what joy and yet fear she felt. They were now on the stairs and in a small closet at the top, a lamp was burning. In the middle of the floor stood the tame crow turning her head from side to side and gazing at Gerda, who curtsied 
as her grandmother had taught her to do. My betrothed has spoken so very highly of you, my little lady, said the tame crow. Your life history, Vita, as it may be called, is very touching. If you will take the lamp, I will walk before you. We will go straight along this way, then we shall meet no one. It seems to me as if somebody were behind us, said Gerda, as something rushed by her like a shadow on the wall, and then horses with flying manes and thin legs, hunters, ladies and gentlemen on horseback glided by her like shadows on the wall. They are only dreams, said the crow. They are coming to fetch the thoughts of the great people out hunting. All the better, for we shall be able to look at them in their beds more safely. I hope that when you rise to honor and favor, you will show a grateful heart. You may be quite sure of that, said the crow from the forest. They now came into the first hall the walls of which were hung with rose-colored satin, embroidered with artificial flowers. Here, the dreams again flitted by them, but so quickly that Gerda could not distinguish the royal persons. Each hall appeared more splendid than the last. It was enough to bewilder anyone. At length, they reached a bedroom. The ceiling was like a great palm tree, with glass leaves of the most costly crystal, and over the center of the floor, two beds, each resembling a lily, hung from a stem of gold. One in which the princess lay was white, the other was red, and in this, Gerda had to seek for little Kai. She pushed one of the red leaves aside and saw a little brown neck. Oh, that must be Kai! She called his name out quite loud and held the lamp over him. The dreams rushed back into the room on horseback. He woke and turned his head round. It was not little Kai. The prince was only like him in the neck. Still, he was young and pretty. Then the princess peeped out of her white lily bed and asked what was the matter. Then little Gerda wept and told her story and all that the crows had done to help her. You poor child, said the prince and princess. Then they praised the crows and said they were not angry for what they had done, but that it must not happen again, and this time they should be rewarded. Would you like to have your freedom? asked the princess. Or would you prefer to be raised to the position of court crows, with all that is left in the kitchen for yourselves? Then both the crows bowed and begged to have a fixed appointment, for they thought of their old age, and said it would be so comfortable to feel that they had provision for their old days, as they called it. And then the prince got out of his bed and gave it up to Gerda, he could do no more, and she lay down. She folded her little hands and thought, How good everyone is to me, men and animals too. Then she closed her eyes and fell into a sweet sleep. All the dreams came flying back again to her, and they looked like angels, and one of them drew a little sledge on which sat Kai and nodded to her. But all this was only a dream, and vanished as soon as she awoke. The following day, she was dressed from head to foot in silk and velvet, and they invited her to stay at the palace for a few days and enjoy herself. But she only begged for a pair of boots and a little carriage and a horse to draw it, so that she might go into the wide world to seek for Kai and she obtained not only boots, but also a muff, and she was neatly dressed. And when she was ready to go, there at the door, she found a coach made of pure gold, 
with the coat of arms of the prince and princess shining upon it like a star, and the coachman, footman, and outriders all wearing golden crowns on their heads. The prince and princess themselves helped her into the coach and wished her success. The forest crow, who was now married, accompanied her for the first three miles. He sat by Gerda's side, as he could not bear riding backwards. The tame crow stood in the doorway, flapping her wings. She could not go with them, because she had been suffering from headache ever since the new appointment, no doubt from eating too much. The coach was well stored with sweet cakes, and under the seat were fruit and gingerbread nuts. Farewell, farewell, cried the prince and princess, and little Gerda wept, and the crow wept. And then, after a few miles, the crow also said, Farewell, and this was the saddest parting. However, he flew to a tree and stood flapping his black wings as long as he could see the coach, which glittered in the bright sunshine. Story the Fifth The Little Robber Girl The coach drove on through a thick forest where it lighted up the way like a torch and dazzled the eyes of some robbers who could not bear to let it pass them unmolested. It is gold! It is gold! cried they, rushing forward and seizing the horses. Then they struck the little jockeys, the coachman and the footman dead and pulled little Gerda out of the carriage. She is fat and pretty and she has been fed with the kernels of gnats, said the old robber woman who had a long beard and eyebrows that hung over her eyes. She is as good as a little lamb. How nice she will taste. And as she said this, she drew forth a shining knife that glittered horribly. Oh! screamed the old woman the same moment, for her own daughter, who held her back, had bitten her in the ear. She was a wild and naughty girl, and the mother called her an ugly thing and had not time to kill Gerda. She shall play with me, said the little robber girl. She shall give me her muff and her pretty dress and sleep with me in my bed. And then she bit her mother again and made her spring in the air and jump about. And all the robbers laughed and said, See how she is dancing with her young cub. I will have a ride in the coach, said the little robber girl, and she would have her own way, for she was so self-willed and obstinate. She and Gerda seated themselves in the coach and drove away, over stumps and stones, into the depths of the forest. The little robber girl was about the same size as Gerda, but stronger. She had broader shoulders and a darker skin. Her eyes were quite black, and she had a mournful look. She clasped little Gerda round the waist and said, They shall not kill you as long as you don't make us vexed with you. I suppose you are a princess. No, said Gerda. And then she told her all her history and how fond she was of little Kai. The robber girl looked earnestly at her nodded her head slightly and said, They shan't kill you, even if I do get angry with you, for I would do it myself. And then she wiped Gerda's eyes and stuck her own hands in the beautiful muff which was so soft and warm. The coach stopped in the courtyard of a robber's castle, the walls of which were cracked from top to bottom. Ravens and crows flew in and out of the holes and crevices, while great bulldogs, either of which looked as if it could swallow a man, were jumping about. But they were not allowed to bark. In the large and smoky hall, a bright fire was burning on the stone floor. 
There was no chimney, so the smoke went up to the ceiling and found a way out for itself. Soup was boiling in a large cauldron, and hares and rabbits were roasting on the spit. You shall sleep with me and all my little animals tonight, said the robber girl, after they had had something to eat and drink. So she took Gerda to a corner of the hall, where some straw and carpets were laid down. Above them, on laths and perches, were more than a hundred pigeons, who all seemed to be asleep, although they moved slightly when the two little girls came near them. These all belong to me, said the robber girl, and she seized the nearest to her, held it by the feet, and shook it till it flapped its wings. Kiss it, cried she, flapping it in Gerda's face. There sit the wood pigeons, continued she, pointing to a number of laths and a cage which had been fixed into the walls near one of the openings. Both rascals would fly away directly if they were not closely locked up. And here is my old sweetheart, Ba. And she dragged out a reindeer by the horn. He wore a bright copper ring round his neck and was tied up. We are obliged to hold him tight too, or else he would run away from us also. I tickle his neck every evening with my sharp knife, which frightens him very much. And then the robber girl drew a long knife from a chink in the wall and let it slide gently over the reindeer's neck. The poor animal began to kick, and the little robber girl laughed and pulled down Gerda into bed with her. Will you have that knife with you while you are asleep? asked Gerda, looking at it in great fright. I always sleep with a knife by me, said the robber girl. No one knows what may happen. But now, tell me again all about little Kai and why you went out into the world. Then Gerda repeated her story over again, while the wood pigeons in the cage over her cooed and the other pigeons slept. The little robber girl put one arm across Gerda's neck and held the knife in the other, and was soon fast asleep and snoring. But Gerda could not close her eyes at all. She knew not whether she was to live or die. The robbers sat round the fire, singing and drinking, and the old woman stumbled about. It was a terrible sight for a little girl to witness. Then the wood pigeon said, Coo, coo, we have seen little Kai. A white fowl carried his sledge, and he sat in the carriage of the Snow Queen, which drove through the wood while we were lying in our nest. She blew upon us, and all the young ones died, excepting us too. Coo, coo. What are you saying up there? cried Gerda. Where was the Snow Queen going? Do you know anything about it? She was most likely travelling to Lapland, where there is always snow and ice. Ask the reindeer that is fastened up there with a rope. Yes, there is always snow and ice, said the reindeer, and it is a glorious place. You can leap and run about freely on the sparkling ice plains. The Snow Queen has her summer tent there, but her strong castle is at the North Pole on an island called Spitsbergen. Oh, Kai, little Kai, sighed Gerda. Lie still, said the robber girl, or I shall run my knife into your body. In the morning, Gerda told her all that the wood pigeons had said, and the little robber girl looked quite serious and nodded her head and said, That is all talk. That is all talk. Do you know where Lapland is? She asked the reindeer. Who should know better than I do? Said the animal, while his eyes sparkled. I was born and brought up there, and I used to run about the snow-covered plains. Now listen, 
said the robber girl. All our men are gone away. Only mother is here, and here she will stay. But at noon, she always drinks out of a great bottle and afterwards sleeps for a little while. And then, I'll do something for you. Then she jumped out of bed, clasped her mother round the neck and pulled her by the beard, crying, My own little nanny goat, good morning. Then her mother filliped her nose till it was quite red. Yet she did it all for love. When the mother had drunk out of the bottle and was gone to sleep, the little robber maiden went to the reindeer and said, I should like very much to tickle your neck a few times more with my knife, for it makes you look so funny. But never mind, I will untie your cord and set you free, so that you may run away to Lapland. But you must make good use of your legs and carry this little maiden to the castle of the Snow Queen, where her playfellow is. You have heard what she told me, for she spoke loud enough, and you were listening. Then the reindeer jumped for joy, and the little robber girl lifted Gerda on his back and had the forethought to tie her on, and even to give her her own little cushion to sit on. Here are your fur boots for you, said she, for it will be very cold, but I must keep the muff, it is so pretty. However, you shall not be frozen for the want of it, here are my mother's large warm mittens. They will reach up to your elbows. Let me put them on. There, now your hands look just like my mother's. But Gerda wept for joy. I don't like to see you fret, said the little robber girl. You ought to look quite happy now. And here are two loaves and a ham, so that you need not starve. These were fastened on the reindeer. And then the little robber maiden opened the door, coaxed in all the great dogs, and then cut the string with which the reindeer was fastened with her sharp knife, and said, Now, run, but mind you take good care of the little girl. And then Gerda stretched out her hand with the great mitten on it towards the little robber girl, and said, Farewell. And away flew the reindeer, over stumps and stones, through the great forest, over marshes and plains as quickly as he could. The wolves howled, and the ravens screamed, while up in the sky quivered red lights like flames of fire. There are my old northern lights, said the reindeer. See how they flash! and he ran on day and night, still faster and faster. But the loaves and the ham were all eaten by the time they reached Lapland. Story the Sixth The Lapland Woman and the Finland Woman They stopped at a little hut. It was very mean-looking, the roof sloped nearly down to the ground, and the door was so low that the family had to creep in on their hands and knees when they went in and out. There was no one at home but an old Lapland woman who was cooking fish by the light of a train oil lamp. The reindeer told her all about Gerda's story, after having first told his own, which seemed to him the most important. But Gerda was so pinched with the cold that she could not speak. Oh, you poor things, said the Lapland woman. You have a long way to go yet. You must travel more than a hundred miles farther to Finland. The Snow Queen lives there now, and she burns Bengal lights every evening. I will write a few words on a dried stockfish, for I have no paper and you can take it from me to the Finland woman who lives there. She can give you better information than I can. So, when Gerda was warmed and had taken something to eat and drink, the woman wrote a few words on the dried fish and told Gerda to take great care of it. 
Then she tied her again on the reindeer, and he set off at full speed. Flash, flash, went the beautiful blue northern lights in the air the whole night long. And at length, they reached Finland and knocked at the chimney of the Finland woman's hut, for it had no door above the ground. They crept in, but it was so terribly hot inside that that woman wore scarcely any clothes. She was small and very dirty looking. She loosened little Gerda's dress and took off the fur boots and the mittens, or Gerda would have been unable to bear the heat. And then she placed a piece of ice on the reindeer's head and read what was written on the dried fish. After she had read it three times, she knew it by heart, so she popped the fish into the soup saucepan as she knew it was good to eat, and she never wasted anything. The reindeer told his own story first, and then little Gerda's, and the Finlander twinkled with her clever eyes, but she said nothing. You are so clever, said the reindeer. I know you can tie all the winds of the world with a piece of twine. If a sailor unties one knot, he has a fair wind. When he unties the second, it blows hard. But if the third and fourth are loosened, then comes a storm which will root up whole forests. Cannot you give this little maiden something which will make her as strong as twelve men to overcome the Snow Queen? The power of twelve men, said the Finland woman. That would be of very little use. But she went to a shelf and took down and unrolled a large skin, on which were inscribed wonderful characters and she read till the perspiration ran down from her forehead. But the reindeer begged so hard for little Gerda, and Gerda looked at the Finland woman with such beseeching, tearful eyes, that her own eyes began to twinkle again. So she drew the reindeer into a corner and whispered to him while she laid a fresh piece of ice on his head. Little Kai is really with the Snow Queen, but he finds everything there so much to his taste and his liking that he believes it is the finest place in the world. But this is because he has a piece of broken glass in his heart and a little piece of glass in his eye. These must be taken out or he will never be a human being again and the Snow Queen will retain her power over him. But can you not give little Gerda something to help her to conquer this power? I can give her no greater power than she has already, said the woman. Don't you see how strong that is? How men and animals are obliged to serve her, and how well she has got through the world, barefooted as she is. She cannot receive any power from me greater than she now has, which consists in her own purity and innocence of heart. If she cannot herself obtain access to the Snow Queen and remove the glass fragments from little Kai, we can do nothing to help her. Two miles from here, the Snow Queen's garden begins. You can carry the little girl so far, and set her down by the large bush which stands in the snow, covered with red berries. Do not stay gossiping, but come back here as quickly as you can. Then the Finland woman lifted little Gerda upon the reindeer, and he ran away with her as quickly as he could. Oh, I have forgotten my boots and my mittens, cried little Gerda as soon as she felt the cutting cold but the reindeer dared not stop. So he ran on till he reached the bush with the red berries. Here he set Gerda down, and he kissed her, and the great bright tears trickled over the animal's cheeks. Then he left her and ran back as fast as he could. There stood poor Gerda, without shoes, without gloves, in the midst of cold, dreary, ice-bound Finland. 
She ran forwards as quickly as she could when a whole regiment of snowflakes came round her. They did not, however, fall from the sky, which was quite clear and glittering with the northern lights. The snowflakes ran along the ground, and the nearer they came to her, the larger they appeared. Gerda remembered how large and beautiful they looked through the burning glass, but these were really much larger and much more terrible, for they were alive and were the guardians of the Snow Queen and had the strangest shapes. Some were like great porcupines, others like twisted serpents with their heads stretching out, and some few were like little fat bears with their hair bristled. But all were dazzlingly white, and all were living snowflakes. Then little Gerda repeated the Lord's Prayer, and the cold was so great that she could see her own breath come out of her mouth like steam as she uttered the words. The steam appeared to increase as she continued her prayer, till it took the shape of little angels, who grew larger the moment they touched the earth. They all wore helmets on their heads and carried spears and shields. Their number continued to increase more and more, and by the time Gerda had finished her prayers, a whole legion stood round her. They thrust their spears into the terrible snowflakes so that they shivered into a hundred pieces, and little Gerda could go forward with courage and safety. The angels stroked her hands and feet so that she felt the cold less, and she hastened on to the Snow Queen's castle. But now we must see what Kai is doing. In truth, he thought not of little Gerda, and never supposed she could be standing in front of the palace. Story the Seventh Of the Palace of the Snow Queen, and what happened there at last. The walls of the palace were formed of drifted snow, and the windows and doors of the cutting winds. There were more than a hundred rooms in it, all as if they had been formed with snow blown together. The largest of them extended for several miles. They were all lighted up by the vivid light of the aurora, and they were so large and empty, so icy cold and glittering. There were no amusements here, not even a little bear's ball, when the storm might have been the music and the bears could have danced on their hind legs and shown their good manners. There were no pleasant games of snapdragon or touch or even a gossip over the tea table for the young lady foxes. Empty, vast and cold were the halls of the Snow Queen. The flickering flame of the northern lights could be plainly seen whether they rose high or low in the heavens from every part of the castle. In the midst of its empty, endless hall of snow was a frozen lake, broken on its surface into a thousand forms. Each piece resembled another, from being in itself perfect as a work of art. And in the center of this lake sat the Snow Queen when she was at home. She called the lake the Mirror of Reason, and said that it was the best and indeed the only one in the world. Little Kai was quite blue with cold, indeed almost black, but he did not feel it, for the Snow Queen had kissed away the icy shiverings, and his heart was already a lump of ice. He dragged some sharp, flat pieces of ice to and fro, and placed them together in all kinds of positions, as if he wished to make something out of them, just as we try to form various figures with little tablets of wood, which we call a Chinese puzzle. Kai's fingers were very artistic. It was the icy game of reason at which he played, and in his eyes the figures were very remarkable and of the highest importance. This opinion was owing to the piece of glass still sticking in his eye. 
he composed many complete figures, forming different words. But there was one word he never could manage to form, although he wished it very much. It was the word eternity. The Snow Queen had said to him, When you can find out this, you shall be your own master, and I will give you the whole world and a new pair of skates. But he could not accomplish it. Now I must hasten away to warmer countries, said the Snow Queen. I will go and look into the black craters of the tops of the burning mountains, Etna and Vesuvius, as they are called. I shall make them look white, which will be good for them, and for the lemons and the grapes. And away flew the Snow Queen, leaving little Kai quite alone in the great hall, which was so many miles in length. So he sat and looked at his pieces of ice, and was thinking so deeply and sat so still that anyone might have supposed he was frozen. Just at this moment it happened that little Gerda came through the great door of the castle. Cutting winds were raging around her, but she offered up a prayer, and the winds sank down as if they were going to sleep. And she went on till she came to the large empty hall and caught sight of Kai. She knew him directly. She flew to him and threw her arms round his neck and held him fast, while she exclaimed, Kai, dear little Kai, I have found you at last. But he sat quite still, stiff and cold. Then little Gerda wept hot tears, which fell on his breast and penetrated into his heart and thawed the lump of ice and washed away the little piece of glass which had stuck there. Then he looked at her, and she sang, Roses bloom and cease to be, but we shall the Christ child see. Then Kai burst into tears, and he wept so that the splinter of glass swam out of his eye. Then he recognized Gerda and said joyfully, Gerda, dear little Gerda, where have you been all this time, and where have I been? And he looked all around him, and he said, How cold it is, and how large and empty it all looks. And he clung to Gerda, and she laughed and wept for joy. It was so pleasing to see them that the pieces of ice even danced about. And when they were tired and went to lie down, they formed themselves into the letters of the word which the Snow Queen had said he must find out, before he could be his own master and have the whole world and a pair of new skates. Then Gerda kissed his cheeks and they became blooming and she kissed his eyes and they shone like her own. She kissed his hands and his feet and then he became quite healthy and cheerful. The Snow Queen might come home now when she pleased for there stood his certainty of freedom in the word she wanted written in shining letters of ice. Then they took each other by the hand and went forth from the great palace of ice. They spoke of the grandmother and of the roses on the roof. And as they went on, the winds were at rest and the sun burst forth. When they arrived at the bush with red berries, there stood the reindeer waiting for them and he had brought another young reindeer with him, whose udders were full, and the children drank her warm milk and kissed her. Then they carried Kai and Gerda first to the Finland woman, where they warmed themselves thoroughly in the hot room, and she gave them directions about their journey home. Next, they went to the Lapland woman, who had made some new clothes for them and put their sleighs in order. Both the reindeer ran by their side and followed them as far as the boundaries of the country where the first green leaves were budding. And here they took leave of the two reindeer and the Lapland woman, 
and all said, Farewell. Then the birds began to twitter, and the forest too was full of green young leaves, and out of it came a beautiful horse, which Gerda remembered, for it was one which had drawn the golden coach. A young girl was riding upon it, with a shining red cap on her head, and pistols in her belt. It was the little robber maiden, who had got tired of staying at home. She was going first to the north, and if that did not suit her, she meant to try some other part of the world. She knew Gerda directly, and Gerda remembered her. It was a joyful meeting. You are a fine fellow to go gadding about in this way, said she to little Kai. I should like to know whether you deserve that anyone should go to the end of the world to find you. But Gerda patted her cheeks and asked after the prince and princess. They are gone to foreign countries, said the robber girl. And the crow? asked Gerda. Oh, the crow is dead, she replied. His tame sweetheart is now a widow and wears a bit of black worsted round her leg. She mourns very pitifully, but it is all stuff. But now, tell me how you managed to get him back. Then Gerda and Kai told her all about it. Snip, snap, snare. It's all right at last, said the robber girl. Then she took both their hands and promised that if ever she should pass through the town, she would call and pay them a visit. And then she rode away into the wide world. But Gerda and Kai went hand in hand towards home. And as they advanced, spring appeared more lovely with its green verdure and its beautiful flowers. Very soon, they recognized the large town where they lived and the tall steeples of the churches in which the sweet bells were ringing a merry peal as they entered it and found their way to their grandmother's door. They went upstairs into the little room where all looked just as it used to do. The old clock was going tick, tick, and the hands pointed to the time of day. But as they passed through the door into the room, they perceived that they were both grown up and become a man and woman. The roses out on the roof were in full bloom and peeped in at the window. And there stood the little chairs on which they had sat when children, and Kai and Gerda seated themselves each on their own chair and held each other by the hand, while the cold, empty grandeur of the Snow Queen's palace vanished from their memories like a painful dream. The grandmother sat in God's bright sunshine, and she read aloud, Except ye become as children, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. And Kai and Gerda looked into each other's eyes, and all at once understood the words of the old song. Roses bloom and cease to be, but we shall the Christ child see. And they both sat there, grown up, yet children at heart. And it was summer, warm, beautiful summer. The Little Match Girl It was terribly cold and nearly dark on the last evening of the old year, and the snow was falling fast. In the cold and the darkness, a poor little girl with bare head and naked feet roamed through the streets. It is true, she had on a pair of slippers when she left home, but they were not of much use. They were very large, so large indeed, that they had belonged to her mother, and the poor little creature had lost them in running across the street to avoid two carriages that were rolling along at a terrible rate. One of the slippers she could not find, 
and a boy seized upon the other and ran away with it, saying that he could use it as a cradle when he had children of his own. So the little girl went on with her little naked feet, which were quite red and blue with the cold. In an old apron, she carried a number of matches and had a bundle of them in her hands. No one had bought anything of her the whole day, nor had anyone given her even a penny. Shivering with cold and hunger, she crept along. Poor little child, she looked the picture of misery. The snowflakes fell on her long, fair hair, which hung in curls on her shoulders, but she regarded them not. Lights were shining from every window, and there was a savoury smell of roast goose, for it was New Year's Eve. Yes, she remembered that. In a corner between two houses, one of which projected beyond the other, she sank down and huddled herself together. She had drawn her little feet under her, but she could not keep off the cold, and she dared not go home, for she had sold no matches and could not take home even a penny of money. Her father would certainly beat her. Besides, it was almost as cold at home as here, for they had only the roof to cover them, through which the wind howled, although the largest holes had been stopped up with straw and rags. Her little hands were almost frozen with the cold. Ah, perhaps a burning match might be some good, if she could draw it from the bundle and strike it against the wall, just to warm her fingers. She drew one out. Scratch! How it sputtered as it burnt. It gave a warm, bright light, like a little candle, as she held her hand over it. It was really a wonderful light. It seemed to the little girl that she was sitting by a large iron stove with polished brass feet and a brass ornament. How the fire burned and seemed so beautifully warm that the child stretched out her feet as if to warm them, when, lo, the flame of the match went out, the stove vanished, and she had only the remains of the half-burnt match in her hand. She rubbed another match on the wall. It burst into flame and where its light fell upon the wall, it became as transparent as a veil, and she could see into the room. The table was covered with a snowy white tablecloth, on which stood a splendid dinner service and a steaming roast goose stuffed with apples and dried plums. And what was still more wonderful, the goose jumped down from the dish and waddled across the floor with a knife and fork in its breast, to the little girl. Then the match went out, and there remained nothing but the thick, damp, cold wall before her. She lighted another match, and then she found herself sitting under a beautiful Christmas tree. It was larger and more beautifully decorated than the one which she had seen through the glass door at the rich merchant's. Thousands of tapers were burning upon the green branches, and coloured pictures, like those she had seen in the show windows, looked down upon it all. The little one stretched out her hand towards them, and the match went out. The Christmas lights rose higher and higher, till they looked to her like the stars in the sky. Then she saw a star fall leaving behind it a bright streak of fire. Someone is dying, thought the little girl, for her old grandmother, the only one who had ever loved her and who was now dead, had told her that when a star falls, a soul was going up to God. She again rubbed a match on the wall, and the light shone round her. In the brightness, stood her old grandmother, 
clear and shining, yet mild and loving in her appearance. Grandmother, cried the little one, oh, take me with you. I know you will go away when the match burns out. You will vanish like the warm stove, the roast goose, and the large, glorious Christmas tree. And she made haste to light the whole bundle of matches, for she wished to keep her grandmother there. And the matches glowed with a light that was brighter than the noonday, and her grandmother had never appeared so large or so beautiful. She took the little girl in her arms, and they both flew upwards in brightness and joy, far above the earth, where there was neither cold, nor hunger, nor pain, for they were with God. In the dawn of morning, there lay the poor little one, with pale cheeks and smiling mouth, leaning against the wall. She had been frozen to death on the last evening of the year, and the New Year's sun rose and shone upon a little corpse. The child still sat in the stiffness of death, holding the matches in her hand, one bundle of which was burnt. She tried to warm herself, said some. No one imagined what beautiful thing she had seen, nor into what glory she had entered with her grandmother on New Year's Day. Thumbelina There was once a woman who wished very much to have a little child, but she could not obtain her wish. At last, she went to a fairy and said, I should so very much like to have a little child. Can you tell me where I can find one? Oh, that can be easily managed, said the fairy. Here is a barley corn of a different kind to those which grow in the farmer's fields and which the chickens eat. Put it into a flower pot and see what will happen. Thank you, said the woman, and she gave the fairy twelve shillings, which was the price of the barley corn. Then she went home and planted it, and immediately there grew up a large, handsome flower, something like a tulip in appearance, but with its leaves tightly closed, as if it were still a bud. It is a beautiful flower, said the woman, and she kissed the red and golden-colored leaves, and while she did so, the flower opened, and she could see that it was a real tulip. Within the flower, Upon the green velvet stamens sat a very delicate and graceful little maiden. She was scarcely half as long as a thumb, and they gave her the name of Thumbelina, or Tiny, because she was so small. A walnut shell, elegantly polished, served her for a cradle. Her bed was formed of blue violet leaves, with a rose leaf for a counterpane. Here she slept at night, but during the day she amused herself on a table where the woman had placed a plate full of water. Round this plate were wreaths of flowers with their stems in the water, and upon it floated a large tulip leaf which served Tiny for a boat. Here the little maiden sat and rowed herself from side to side with two oars made of white horsehair. It really was a very pretty sight. Tiny could also sing so softly and sweetly that nothing like her singing had ever before been heard. One night, while she lay in her pretty bed, a large, ugly, wet toad crept through a broken pane of glass in the window and leaped right upon the table where Tiny lay sleeping under her rose-leaf quilt. What a pretty little wife this would make for my son, 
said the toad, and she took up the walnut shell in which little Tiny lay asleep and jumped through the window with it into the garden. In the swampy margin of a broad stream in the garden lived the toad with her son. He was uglier even than his mother, and when he saw the pretty little maiden in her elegant bed, he could only cry, Croak, croak, croak. Don't speak so loud or she will wake, said the toad, and then she might run away, for she is as light as swans down. We will place her on one of the water lily leaves out in the stream. It will be like an island to her, she is so light and small, and then she cannot escape. And while she is away, we will make haste and prepare the state room under the marsh in which you are to live when you are married. Far out in the stream grew a number of water lilies with broad green leaves which seemed to float on the top of the water. The largest of these leaves appeared farther off than the rest, and the old toad swam out to it with the walnut shell in which little Tiny lay still asleep. The tiny little creature woke very early in the morning and began to cry bitterly when she found where she was, for she could see nothing but water on every side of the large green leaf and no way of reaching the land. Meanwhile, the old toad was very busy under the marsh decking her room with rushes and wild yellow flowers to make it look pretty for her new daughter-in-law. Then she swam out with her ugly son to the leaf on which she had placed poor little Tiny. She wanted to fetch the pretty bed that she might put it in the bridal chamber to be ready for her. The old toad bowed low to her in the water and said, here is my son. He will be your husband, and you will live happily in the marsh by the stream. Croak, 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 was all her son could say for himself. So the toad took up the elegant little bed and swam away with it, leaving Tiny all alone on the green leaf where she sat and wept. She could not bear to think of living with the old toad and having her ugly son for a husband. The little fishes who swam about in the water beneath had seen the toad and heard what she said, so they lifted their heads above the water to look at the little maiden. As soon as they caught sight of her, they saw she was very pretty, and it made them very sorry to think that she must go and live with the ugly toads. No, it must never be. So they assembled together in the water, round the green stalk which held the leaf on which the little maiden stood, and gnawed it away at the root with their teeth. Then the leaf floated down the stream, carrying Tiny far away out of reach of land. Tiny sailed past many towns, and the little birds in the bushes saw her and sang, What a lovely little creature! So the leaf swam away with her farther and farther, till it brought her to other lands. A graceful little white butterfly constantly fluttered round her, and at last alighted on the leaf. Tiny pleased him, and she was glad of it for now the toad could not possibly reach her, and the country through which she sailed was beautiful, and the sun shone upon the water till it glittered like liquid gold. She took off her girdle and tied one end of it round the butterfly, and the other end of the ribbon she fastened to the leaf, which now glided on much faster than ever, taking little Tiny with it as she stood. Presently, a large cockchafer flew by. The moment he caught sight of her, he seized her round her delicate waist with his claws and flew with her into a tree. The green leaf floated away on the brook, 
and the butterfly flew with it, for he was fastened to it and could not get away. Oh, how frightened little Tiny felt when the cockchafer flew with her to the tree. But especially was she sorry for the beautiful white butterfly which she had fastened to the leaf, for if he could not free himself, he would die of hunger. But the cockchafer did not trouble himself at all about the matter. He seated himself by her side on a large green leaf, gave her some honey from the flowers to eat, and told her she was very pretty, though not in the least like a cockchafer. After a time, all the cockchafers turned up their feelers and said, She has only two legs. How ugly that looks. She has no feelers, said another. Her waist is quite slim. Pooh, she is like a human being. Oh, she is ugly, said all the lady cockchafers, although Tiny was very pretty. Then the cockchafer who had run away with her believed all the others when they said she was ugly and would have nothing more to say to her and told her she might go where she liked. Then he flew down with her from the tree and placed her on a daisy, and she wept at the thought that she was so ugly that even the cockchafers would have nothing to say to her. And all the while, she was really the loveliest creature that one could imagine, and as tender and delicate as a beautiful rose leaf. During the whole summer, poor little Tiny lived quite alone in the wide forest. She wove herself a bed with blades of grass and hung it up under a broad leaf to protect herself from the rain. She sucked the honey from the flowers for food and drank the dew from their leaves every morning. So passed away the summer and the autumn, and then came the winter, the long, cold winter. All the birds who had sung to her so sweetly were flown away, and the trees and the flowers had withered. The large clover leaf under the shelter of which she had lived was now rolled together and shriveled up. Nothing remained but a yellow, withered stalk. She felt dreadfully cold, for her clothes were torn, and she was herself so frail and delicate that poor little Tiny was nearly frozen to death. It began to snow too, and the snowflakes, as they fell upon her, were like a whole shovelful falling upon one of us, for we are tall, but she was only an inch high. Then she wrapped herself up in a dry leaf, but it cracked in the middle and could not keep her warm, and she shivered with cold. Near the wood in which she had been living lay a cornfield, but the corn had been cut a long time. Nothing remained but the bare, dry stubble standing up out of the frozen ground. It was to her like struggling through a large wood. Oh, how she shivered with the cold. She came at last to the door of a field mouse, who had a little den under the corn stubble. There dwelt the field mouse in warmth and comfort, with a whole room full of corn, a kitchen, and a beautiful dining room. Poor little Tiny stood before the door, just like a little beggar girl, and begged for a small piece of barley corn, for she had been without a morsel to eat for two days. You poor little creature, said the field mouse, who was really a good old field mouse. Come into my warm room and dine with me. She was very pleased with Tiny, so she said, You are quite welcome to stay with me all the winter if you like, but you must keep my rooms clean and neat and tell me stories, for I shall like to hear them very much. And Tiny did all the field mouse asked her and found herself very comfortable. We shall have a visitor soon, said the field mouse one day. My neighbor pays me a visit once a week. He is better off than I am, 
He has large rooms and wears a beautiful black velvet coat. If you could only have him for a husband, you would be well provided for indeed. But he is blind, so you must tell him some of your prettiest stories. But Tiny did not feel at all interested about this neighbor, for he was a mole. However, he came and paid his visit, dressed in his black velvet coat. He is very rich and learned, and his house is twenty times larger than mine, said the field mouse. He was rich and learned, no doubt, but he always spoke slightingly of the sun and the pretty flowers, because he had never seen them. Tiny was obliged to sing to him, Ladybird, Ladybird, fly away home, and many other pretty songs. And the mole fell in love with her, because she had such a sweet voice. But he said nothing yet, for he was very cautious. A short time before, the mole had dug a long passage under the earth, which led from the dwelling of the field mouse to his own, and here she had permission to walk with Tiny whenever she liked. But he warned them not to be alarmed at the sight of a dead bird which lay in the passage. It was a perfect bird, with a beak and feathers, and could not have been dead long, and was lying just where the mole had made his passage. The mole took a piece of phosphorescent wood in his mouth, and it glittered like fire in the dark. Then he went before them to light them through the long, dark passage. When they came to the spot where lay the dead bird, the mole pushed his broad nose through the ceiling. The earth gave way, so that there was a large hole, and the daylight shone into the passage. In the middle of the floor lay a dead swallow. His beautiful wings pulled close to his sides, his feet and his head drawn up under his feathers. The poor bird had evidently died of the cold. It made little Tiny very sad to see it. She did so love the little birds. All the summer they had sung and twittered for her so beautifully. But the mole pushed it aside with his crooked legs and said, He will sing no more now. How miserable it must be to be born a little bird. I am thankful that none of my children will ever be birds, for they can do nothing but cry. Tweet, tweet, and always die of hunger in the winter. Yes, you may well say that as a clever man, exclaimed the field mouse. What is the use of his twittering, for when winter comes he must either starve or be frozen to death. Still, birds are very high bred. Tiny said nothing, but when the two others had turned their backs on the bird, she stooped down and stroked aside the soft feathers which covered the head and kissed the closed eyelids. Perhaps this was the one who sang to me so sweetly in the summer, she said, and how much pleasure it gave me, you dear pretty bird. The mole now stopped up the hole through which the daylight shone and then accompanied the lady home. But during the night, Tiny could not sleep, so she got out of bed and wove a large, beautiful carpet of hay. Then she carried it to the dead bird and spread it over him, with some down from the flowers which she had found in the field mouse's room. It was as soft as wool, and she spread some of it on each side of the bird, so that he might lie warmly in the cold earth. Farewell you pretty little bird, said she. Farewell. Thank you for your delightful singing during the summer, when all the trees were green and the warm sun shone upon us. Then she laid her head on the bird's breast, but she was alarmed immediately, for it seemed as if something inside the bird went thump, thump. It was the bird's heart, he was not really dead, only benumbed with the cold, and the warmth had restored him to life. 
In autumn, all the swallows fly away into warm countries. But if one happens to linger, the cold seizes it. It becomes frozen and falls down as if dead. It remains where it fell, and the cold snow covers it. Tiny trembled very much. She was quite frightened, for the bird was large, a great deal larger than herself. She was only an inch high. But she took courage, laid the wool more thickly over the poor swallow, and then took a leaf which she had used for her own counterpane, and laid it over the head of the poor bird. The next morning, she again stole out to see him. He was alive, but very weak. He could only open his eyes for a moment to look at Tiny, who stood by holding a piece of decayed wood in her hand, for she had no other lantern. Thank you, pretty little maiden, said the sick swallow. I have been so nicely warmed that I shall soon regain my strength and be able to fly about again in the warm sunshine. Oh, said she, it is cold out of doors now. It snows and freezes. Stay in your warm bed. I will take care of you. Then she brought the swallow some water in a flower leaf, and after he had drank, he told her that he had wounded one of his wings in a thorn bush and could not fly as fast as the others, who were soon far away on their journey to warm countries. Then, at last, he had fallen to the earth and could remember no more, nor how he came to be where she had found him. The whole winter, the swallow remained underground, and Tiny nursed him with care and love. Neither the mole nor the field mouse knew anything about it, for they did not like swallows. Very soon, the springtime came, and the sun warmed the earth. Then, the swallow bade farewell to Tiny, and she opened the hole in the ceiling which the mole had made. The sun shone in upon them so beautifully that the swallow asked her if she would go with him. She could sit on his back, he said, and he would fly away with her into the green woods. But Tiny knew it would make the field mouse very grieved if she left her in that manner. So she said, No, I cannot. Farewell then, farewell you good, pretty little maiden, said the swallow, and he flew out into the sunshine. Tiny looked after him, and the tears rose in her eyes. She was very fond of the poor swallow. Tweet, tweet, sang the bird as he flew out into the green woods, and Tiny felt very sad. She was not allowed to go out into the warm sunshine. The corn which had been sown in the field over the house of the field mouse had grown up high into the air and formed a thick wood to Tiny, who was only an inch in height. You are going to be married, Tiny, said the field mouse. My neighbor has asked for you. What good fortune for a poor child like you. Now we will prepare your wedding clothes. They must be both woolen and linen. Nothing must be wanting when you are the mole's wife. Tiny had to turn the spindle, and the field mouse hired four spiders who were to weave day and night. Every evening, the mole visited her and was continually speaking of the time when the summer would be over. Then he would keep his wedding day with Tiny. But now, the heat of the sun was so great that it burned the earth and made it quite hard like a stone. As soon as the summer was over, the wedding should take place. But Tiny was not at all pleased for she did not like the tiresome mole. Every morning when the sun rose, and every evening when it went down, she would creep out at the door, and as the wind blew aside the ears of corn so that she could see the blue sky, 
she thought how beautiful and bright it seemed out there, and wished so much to see her dear swallow again. But he never returned, for by this time he had flown far away into the lovely green forest. When autumn arrived, Tiny had her outfit quite ready, and the field mouse said to her, In four weeks, the wedding must take place. Then Tiny wept and said she would not marry the disagreeable mole. Nonsense, replied the field mouse. Now don't be obstinate or I shall bite you with my white teeth. He is a very handsome mole. The queen herself does not wear more beautiful velvets and furs. His kitchen and cellars are quite full. You ought to be very thankful for such good fortune. So the wedding day was fixed, on which the mole was to fetch Tiny away to live with him, deep under the earth, and never again to see the warm sun, because he did not like it. The poor child was very unhappy at the thought of saying farewell to the beautiful sun, and as the field mouse had given her permission to stand at the door, she went to look at it once more. Farewell, bright sun, she cried, stretching out her arm towards it. And then she walked a short distance from the house, for the corn had been cut, and only the dry stubble remained in the fields. Farewell, farewell, she repeated, twining her arm round a little red flower that grew just by her side. Greet the little swallow from me, if you should see him again. Tweet, tweet, sounded over her head suddenly. She looked up, and there was the swallow himself flying close by. As soon as he spied Tiny, he was delighted. And then she told him how unwilling she felt to marry the ugly mole and to live always beneath the earth, and never to see the bright sun any more. And as she told him, she wept. Cold winter is coming, said the swallow, and I am going to fly away into warmer countries. Will you go with me? You can sit on my back and fasten yourself on with your sash. Then we can fly away from the ugly mole and his gloomy rooms, far away, over the mountains, into warmer countries, where the sun shines more brightly than here, where it is always summer and the flowers bloom in greater beauty. Fly now with me, dear little Tiny. You saved my life when I lay frozen in that dark passage. Yes. I will go with you, said Tiny, and she seated herself on the bird's back with her feet on his outstretched wings and tied her girdle to one of his strongest feathers. Then the swallow rose in the air and flew over forest and over sea, high above the highest mountains covered with eternal snow. Tiny would have been frozen in the cold air but she crept under the bird's warm feathers, keeping her little head uncovered so that she might admire the beautiful lands over which they passed. At length, they reached the warm countries where the sun shines brightly and the sky seems so much higher above the earth. Here, on the hedges and by the wayside, grew purple, green and white grapes. Lemons and oranges hung from trees in the woods, and the air was fragrant with myrtles and orange blossoms. Beautiful children ran along the country lanes, playing with large, gay butterflies. And as the swallow flew farther and farther, every place appeared still more lovely. At last, they came to a blue lake, and by the side of it, Shaded by trees of the deepest green, stood a palace of dazzling white marble built in the olden times. Vines clustered round its lofty pillars, and at the top 
were many swallows' nests, and one of these was the home of the swallow who carried Tiny. This is my house, said the swallow, but it would not do for you to live there. You would not be comfortable. You must choose for yourself one of those lovely flowers, and I will put you down upon it, and then you shall have everything that you can wish to make you happy. That will be delightful, she said, and clapped her little hands for joy. A large marble pillar lay on the ground, which, in falling, had been broken into three pieces. Between these pieces grew the most beautiful large white flowers, so the swallow flew down with Tiny and placed her on one of the broad leaves. But how surprised she was to see in the middle of the flower a tiny little man, as white and transparent as if he had been made of crystal. He had a gold crown on his head and delicate wings at his shoulders and was not much larger than Tiny herself. He was the angel of the flower, for a tiny man and a tiny woman dwell in every flower, and this was the king of them all. Oh, how beautiful he is, whispered Tiny to the swallow. The little prince was at first quite frightened at the bird, who was like a giant compared to such a delicate little creature as himself. But when he saw Tiny, he was delighted and thought her the prettiest little maiden he had ever seen. He took the gold crown from his head and placed it on hers and asked her name and if she would be his wife and queen over all the flowers. This certainly was a very different sort of husband to the son of a toad or the mole with his black velvet and fur. So she said, yes, to the handsome prince. Then all the flowers opened, and out of each came a little lady or a tiny lord, all so pretty it was quite a pleasure to look at them. Each of them brought Tiny a present, but the best gift was a pair of beautiful wings which had belonged to a large white fly, and they fastened them to Tiny's shoulders so that she might fly from flower to flower. Then there was much rejoicing, and the little swallow who sat above them in his nest was asked to sing a wedding song, which he did as well as he could. But in his heart he felt sad, for he was very fond of Tiny and would have liked never to part from her again. You must not be called Tiny any more, said the spirit of the flowers to her. It is an ugly name, and you are so very pretty. We will call you Maya. Farewell, farewell, said the swallow with a heavy heart as he left the warm countries to fly back into Denmark. There he had a nest over the window of a house in which dwelt the writer of fairy tales. The swallow sang, Tweet, tweet. And from his song came the whole story. The Snowman It is so delightfully cold, said the snowman that it makes my whole body crackle. This is just the kind of wind to blow life into one. How that great red thing up there is staring at me. He meant the sun, who was just setting. It shall not make me wink. I shall manage to keep the pieces. He had two triangular pieces of tile in his head instead of eyes. His mouth was made of an old broken rake and was, of course, furnished with teeth. He had been brought into existence amidst the joyous shouts of boys, the jingling of sleigh bells and the slashing of whips. The sun went down and the full moon rose, large, round and clear, shining 
in the deep blue. There it comes again, from the other side, said the snowman, who supposed the sun was showing himself once more. Ah, I have cured him of staring, though. Now he may hang up there and shine, that I may see myself. If I only knew how to manage to move away from this place, I should so like to move. If I could, I would slide along yonder on the ice, as I have seen the boys do. But I don't understand how. I don't even know how to run. Away! Away! barked the old yard dog. He was quite hoarse and could not pronounce Bow Wow properly. He had once been an indoor dog and lay by the fire, and he had been hoarse ever since. The sun will make you run some day. I saw him last winter make your predecessor run, and his predecessor before him. Away, away, they all have to go. I don't understand you, comrade, said the snowman. Is that thing up yonder to teach me to run? I saw it running itself a little while ago, and now it has come creeping up from the other side. You know nothing at all, replied the yard dog. But then you've only lately been patched up. What you see yonder is the moon, and the one before it was the sun. It will come again tomorrow, and most likely teach you to run down into the ditch by the well, for I think the weather is going to change. I can feel such pricks and stabs in my left leg. I'm sure there's going to be a change. I don't understand him, said the snowman to himself. But I have a feeling that he is talking of something very disagreeable. The one who stared so just now, and whom he calls the sun, is not my friend. I can feel that too. Away! Away! barked the yard dog. And then he turned round three times and crept into his kennel to sleep. There was really a change in the weather. Towards morning, a thick fog covered the whole country round, and a keen wind arose, so that the cold seemed to freeze one's bones. But when the sun rose, the sight was splendid. Trees and bushes were covered with hoarfrost and looked like a forest of white coral, while on every twig glittered frozen dewdrops. The many delicate forms concealed in summer by luxuriant foliage were now clearly defined and looked like glittering lacework. From every twig glistened a white radiance. The birch, waving in the wind, looked full of life, like trees in summer, and its appearance was wondrously beautiful. And where the sun shone, how everything glittered and sparkled, as if diamond dust had been strewn about, while the snowy carpet of the earth appeared as if covered with diamonds from which countless lights gleamed, whiter than even the snow itself. This is really beautiful, said a young girl, who had come into the garden with a young man, and they both stood still near the snowman and contemplated the glittering scene. Summer cannot show a more beautiful sight, she exclaimed, while her eyes sparkled. And we can't have such a fellow as this in the summertime, replied the young man, pointing to the snowman. He is capital. The girl laughed and nodded at the snowman, and then tripped away over the snow with her friend. The snow creaked and crackled beneath her feet, as if she had been treading on starch. Who are these two? asked the snowman of the yard dog. You have been here longer than I have. Do you know them? Of course I know them, replied the yard dog. She has stroked my back many times, and he has given me a bone of meat. I never bite those two. But what are they? asked the snowman. 
they are lovers, he replied. They will go and live in the same kennel by and by and gnaw at the same bone. Away! Away! Are they the same kind of beings as you and I? asked the snowman. Well, they belong to the same master, retorted the yard dog. Certainly people who were only born yesterday know very little. I can see that in you. I have age and experience. I know everyone here in the house, and I know there was once a time when I did not lie out here in the cold fastened to a chain. Away! Away! The cold is delightful, said the snowman. But do tell me, tell me, only you must not clank your chain so, for it jars all through me when you do that. Away! Away! barked the yard dog. I'll tell you. They said I was a pretty little fellow once. Then I used to lie in a velvet-covered chair up at the master's house and sit in the mistress's lap. They used to kiss my nose and wipe my paws with an embroidered handkerchief, and I was called Ami, dear Ami, sweet Ami. But after a while, I grew too big for them, and they sent me away to the housekeeper's room. So I came to live on the lower story. You can look into the room from where you stand and see where I was master once. For I was indeed master to the housekeeper. It was certainly a smaller room than those upstairs, but I was more comfortable for I was not being continually taken hold of and pulled about by the children as I had been. I received quite as good food, or even better. I had my own cushion, and there was a stove. It is the finest thing in the world at this season of the year. I used to go under the stove and lie down quite beneath it. Oh, I still dream of that stove. Away! Away! Does a stove look beautiful? asked the snowman. Is it at all like me? It is just the reverse of you, said the dog. It's as black as a crow and has a long neck and a brass knob. It eats firewood so that fire spurts out of its mouth. We should keep on one side or under it to be comfortable. You can see it through the window from where you stand. Then the snowman looked and saw a bright polished thing with a brazen knob and fire gleaming from the lower part of it. The snowman felt quite a strange sensation come over him. It was very odd. He knew not what it meant, and he could not account for it. But there are people who are not men of snow who understand what it is. And why did you leave her? asked the snowman, for it seemed to him that the stove must be of the female sex. How could you give up such a comfortable place? I was obliged, replied the yard dog. They turned me out of doors and chained me up here. I had bitten the youngest of my master's sons in the leg because he kicked away the bone I was gnawing. Bone for bone, I thought but they were so angry, and from that time I have been fastened with a chain and lost my bone. Don't you hear how hoarse I am? Away! Away! I can't talk any more like other dogs. Away! Away! That is the end of it all. But the snowman was no longer listening. He was looking into the housekeeper's room on the lower story, where the stove stood on its four iron legs, looking about the same size as the snowman himself. What a strange crackling I feel within me, he said. Shall I ever get in there? It is an innocent wish, and innocent wishes are sure to be fulfilled. I must go in there and lean against her, even if I have to break the window. You must never go in there, said the yard dog, 
for if you approach the stove, you'll melt away, away. I might as well go, said the snowman, for I think I am breaking up as it is. During the whole day, the snowman stood looking in through the window, and in the twilight hour, the room became still more inviting, for from the stove came a gentle glow, not like the sun or the moon, no, only the bright light which gleams from a stove when it has been well fed. When the door of the stove was opened, the flames darted out of its mouth. This is customary with all stoves. The light of the flames fell directly on the face and breast of the snowman with a ruddy gleam. I can endure it no longer, said he. How beautiful it looks when it stretches out its tongue. The night was long, but did not appear so to the snowman, who stood there enjoying his own reflections and crackling with the cold. In the morning, the window panes of the housekeeper's room were covered with ice. They were the most beautiful ice flowers any snowman could desire, but they concealed the stove. These window panes would not thaw, and he could see nothing of the stove, which he pictured to himself as if it had been a lovely human being. The snow crackled, and the wind whistled around him. It was just the kind of frosty weather a snowman might thoroughly enjoy. But he did not enjoy it. How, indeed, could he enjoy anything when he was stove-sick? That is a terrible disease for a snowman, said the yard dog. I have suffered from it myself, but I got over it. Away! Away! He barked, and then he added, The weather is going to change. And the weather did change. It began to thaw. As the warmth increased, the snowman decreased. He said nothing and made no complaint, which is a sure sign. One morning, he broke and sunk down altogether. And behold, where he had stood, something like a broomstick remained sticking up in the ground. It was the pole round which the boys had built him up. Ah, oh, now I understand why he had such a great longing for the stove, said the yard dog. Why, there's the shovel that is used for cleaning out the stove fastened to the pole. The snowman had a stove scraper in his body. That was what moved him so. But it's all over now. Away! Away! And soon the winter passed. Away! Away! Barked the horse yard dog. But the girls in the house sang, Come from your fragrant home, green thyme. Stretch your soft branches, willow tree. The months are bringing the sweet springtime, when the lark in the sky sings joyfully. Come, gentle sun, while the cuckoo sings, and I'll mock his note in my wanderings. And nobody thought any more of the snowman. The Emperor's New Clothes Many, many years ago lived an emperor who thought so much of new clothes that he spent all his money in order to obtain them. His only ambition was to be always well-dressed. He did not care for his soldiers, and the theater did not amuse him. The only thing, in fact, he thought anything of was to drive out and show a new suit of clothes. He had a coat for every hour of the day, and as one would say of a king, he is in his cabinet, so one could say of him, the emperor is in his dressing room. The great city where he resided was very gay. Every day, 
many strangers from all parts of the globe arrived. One day, two swindlers came to this city. They made people believe that they were weavers and declared they could manufacture the finest cloth to be imagined. Their colors and patterns, they said, were not only exceptionally beautiful, but the clothes made of their material possessed the wonderful quality of being invisible to any man who was unfit for his office or unpardonably stupid. That must be wonderful cloth, thought the emperor. If I were to be dressed in a suit made of this cloth, I should be able to find out which men in my empire were unfit for their places, and I could distinguish the clever from the stupid. I must have this cloth woven for me without delay." And he gave a large sum of money to the swindlers in advance, that they should set to work without any loss of time. They set up two looms and pretended to be very hard at work, but they did nothing whatever on the looms. They asked for the finest silk and the most precious gold cloth. All they got, they did away with and worked at the empty looms till late at night. I should very much like to know how they are getting on with the cloth, thought the emperor. But he felt rather uneasy when he remembered that he who was not fit for his office could not see it. Personally, he was of opinion that he had nothing to fear. Yet he thought it advisable to send somebody else first to see how matters stood. Everybody in the town knew what a remarkable quality the stuff possessed, and all were anxious to see how bad or stupid their neighbors were. I shall send my honest old minister to the weavers, thought the emperor. He can judge best how the stuff looks, for he is intelligent, and nobody understands his office better than he. The good old minister went into the room where the swindlers sat before the empty looms. Heaven preserve us, he thought, and opened his eyes wide. I cannot see anything at all. But he did not say so. Both swindlers requested him to come near and asked him if he did not admire the exquisite pattern and the beautiful colors, pointing to the empty looms. The poor old minister tried his very best, but he could see nothing, for there was nothing to be seen. Oh dear, he thought, can I be so stupid? I should never have thought so, and nobody must know it. Is it possible that I am not fit for my office? No, no, I cannot say that I was unable to see the cloth. Now. Have you got nothing to say? said one of the swindlers, while he pretended to be busily weaving. Oh, it is very pretty, exceedingly beautiful, replied the old minister, looking through his glasses. What a beautiful pattern! What brilliant colors! I shall tell the emperor that I like the cloth very much. We are pleased to hear that said the two weavers, and described to him the colors and explained the curious pattern. The old minister listened attentively, that he might relate to the emperor what they said, and so he did. Now the swindlers asked for more money, silk and gold cloth, which they required for weaving. They kept everything for themselves, and not a thread came near the loom, but they continued, as hitherto, to work at the empty looms. Soon afterwards, the emperor sent another honest courtier to the weavers to see how they were getting on, and if the cloth was nearly finished. Like the old minister, he looked and looked, but could see nothing, as there was nothing to be seen. Is it not a beautiful piece of cloth? asked the two swindlers, showing and explaining the magnificent pattern 
which, however, did not exist. I am not stupid, said the man. It is therefore my good appointment for which I am not fit. It is very strange, but I must not let anyone know it. And he praised the cloth, which he did not see, and expressed his joy at the beautiful colors and the fine pattern. It is very excellent, he said to the emperor. Everybody in the whole town talked about the precious cloth. At last, the emperor wished to see it himself while it was still on the loom. With a number of courtiers, including the two who had already been there, he went to the two clever swindlers, who now worked as hard as they could, but without using any thread. Is it not magnificent? said the two old statesmen who had been there before. Your majesty must admire the colors and the pattern. And then they pointed to the empty looms, for they imagined the others could see the cloth. What is this? thought the emperor. I do not see anything at all. That is terrible. Am I stupid? Am I unfit to be emperor? That would indeed be the most dreadful thing that could happen to me. Really, he said, turning to the weavers, your cloth has our most gracious approval. And nodding contentedly, he looked at the empty loom, for he did not like to say that he saw nothing. All his attendants who were with him looked and looked, and although they could not see anything more than the others, they said, like the emperor, It is very beautiful. And all advised him to wear the new magnificent clothes at a great procession which was soon to take place. It is magnificent, beautiful, excellent, one heard them say. Everybody seemed to be delighted and the emperor appointed the two swindlers imperial court weavers. The whole night previous to the day on which the procession was to take place, the swindlers pretended to work and burned more than 16 candles. People should see that they were busy to finish the emperor's new suit. They pretended to take the cloth from the loom and worked about in the air with big scissors and sewed with needles without thread, and said at last, The emperor's new suit is ready now. The emperor and all his barons then came to the hall. The swindlers held their arms up as if they held something in their hands and said, These are the trousers, this is the coat, and here is the cloak, and so on. They are all as light as a cobweb, and one must feel as if one had nothing at all upon the body. But that is just the beauty of them. Indeed, said all the courtiers, but they could not see anything, for there was nothing to be seen. Does it please your majesty now to graciously undress, said the swindlers that we may assist your majesty in putting on the new suit before the large looking-glass. The emperor undressed, and the swindlers pretended to put the new suit upon him, one piece after another, and the emperor looked at himself in the glass from every side. How well they look, how well they fit, said all. What a beautiful pattern! What fine colors! That is a magnificent suit of clothes. The master of the ceremonies announced that the bearers of the canopy, which was to be carried in the procession, were ready. I am ready, said the emperor. Does not my suit fit me marvelously? Then he turned once more to the looking glass, that people should think he admired his garments. The chamberlains, who were to carry the train, stretched their hands to the ground as if they lifted up a train and pretended to hold something in their hands. 
they did not like people to know that they could not see anything. The emperor marched in the procession under the beautiful canopy, and all who saw him in the street and out of the windows exclaimed, Indeed, the emperor's new suit is incomparable. What a long train he has! How well it fits him! Nobody wished to let others know he saw nothing, for then he would have been unfit for his office or too stupid. Never emperor's clothes were more admired. But he has nothing on at all, said a little child at last. Good heavens, listen to the voice of an innocent child, said the father and one whispered to the other what the child had said. But he has nothing on at all, cried at last the whole people. That made a deep impression upon the emperor, for it seemed to him that they were right. But he thought to himself, Now I must bear up to the end. And the chamberlains walked with still greater dignity as if they carried the train, which did not exist. The Red Shoes Once upon a time, there was a little girl, pretty and dainty. But in summertime, she was obliged to go barefooted because she was poor, and in winter she had to wear large wooden shoes so that her little instep grew quite red. In the middle of the village lived an old shoemaker's wife. She sat down and made, as well as she could, a pair of little shoes out of some old pieces of red cloth. They were clumsy, but she meant well, for they were intended for the little girl, whose name was Karen. Karen received the shoes and wore them for the first time on the day of her mother's funeral. They were certainly not suitable for mourning, but she had no others, and so she put her bare feet into them and walked behind the humble coffin. Just then, a large old carriage came by, and in it sat an old lady. She looked at the little girl, and taking pity on her, said to the clergyman, Look here, if you will give me the little girl, I will take care of her. Karen believed that this was all on account of the red shoes, but the old lady thought them hideous, and so they were burnt. Karen herself was dressed very neatly and cleanly. She was taught to read and to sew, and people said that she was pretty. But the mirror told her, you are more than pretty. You are beautiful. One day, the queen was traveling through that part of the country and had her little daughter, who was a princess, with her. All the people, amongst them Karen too, streamed towards the castle where the little princess in fine white clothes stood before the window and allowed herself to be stared at. She wore neither a train nor a golden crown, but beautiful red Morocco shoes. They were indeed much finer than those which the shoemaker's wife had sewn for little Karen. There is really nothing in the world that can be compared to red shoes. Karen was now old enough to be confirmed. She received some new clothes, and she was also to have some new shoes. The rich shoemaker in the town took the measure of her little foot in his own room, in which there stood great glass cases full of pretty shoes and white slippers. It all looked very lovely, but the old lady could not see very well, and therefore did not get much pleasure out of it. Amongst the shoes stood a pair of red ones, like those which the princess had worn. How beautiful they were! And the shoemaker said that they had been made for a count's daughter, but that they had not fitted her. I suppose they are of shiny leather, 
asked the old lady. They shine so. Yes, they do shine, said Karen. They fitted her and were bought. But the old lady knew nothing of their being red, for she would never have allowed Karen to be confirmed in red shoes as she was now to be. Everybody looked at her feet, and the whole of the way from the church door to the choir, it seemed to her as if even the ancient figures on the monuments, in their stiff collars and long black robes, had their eyes fixed on her red shoes. It was only of these that she thought, when the clergyman laid his hand upon her head and spoke of the holy baptism, of the covenant with God, and told her that she was now to be a grown-up Christian. The organ pealed forth solemnly, and the sweet children's voices mingled with that of their old leader. But Karen thought only of her red shoes. In the afternoon, the old lady heard from everybody that Karen had worn red shoes. She said that it was a shocking thing to do, that it was very improper, and that Karen was always to go to church in future in black shoes, even if they were old. On the following Sunday, there was communion. Karen looked first at the black shoes, then at the red ones, looked at the red ones again, and put them on. The sun was shining gloriously, so Karen and the old lady went along the footpath through the corn, where it was rather dusty. At the church door stood an old, crippled soldier, leaning on a crutch. He had a wonderfully long beard, more red than white, and he bowed down to the ground and asked the old lady whether he might wipe her shoes. Then Karen put out her little foot too. Dear me, what pretty dancing shoes, said the soldier. Sit fast when you dance, said he, addressing the shoes and slapping the soles with his hand. The old lady gave the soldier some money and then went with Karen into the church, and all the people inside looked at Karen's red shoes, and all the figures gazed at them. When Karen knelt before the altar and put the golden goblet to her mouth, she thought only of the red shoes. It seemed to her as though they were swimming about in the goblet, and she forgot to sing the psalm, forgot to say the Lord's Prayer. Now everyone came out of church, and the old lady stepped into her carriage. But just as Karen was lifting up her foot to get in too, the old soldier said, Dear me, what pretty dancing shoes. And Karen could not help it. She was obliged to dance a few steps, and when she had once begun, her legs continued to dance. It seemed as if the shoes had got power over them. She danced round the church corner, for she could not stop. The coachman had to run after her and seize her. He lifted her into the carriage, but her feet continued to dance, so that she kicked the good old lady violently. At last, they took off her shoes, and her legs were at rest. At home, the shoes were put into the cupboard, but Karen could not help looking at them. Now the old lady fell ill, and it was said that she would not rise from her bed again. She had to be nursed and waited upon, and this was no one's duty more than Karen's. But there was a grand ball in the town, and Karen was invited. She looked at the red shoes, saying to herself that there was no sin in doing that. She put the red shoes on, thinking there was no harm in that either. And then she went to the ball and commenced to dance. But when she wanted to go to the right, the shoes danced to the left. And when she wanted to dance up the room, the shoes danced down the room, down the stairs, through the street, and out through the gates of the town. She danced and was obliged to dance far out into the dark wood. Suddenly, something shone up among the trees, 
and she believed it was the moon, for it was a face. But it was the old soldier with the red beard. He sat there, nodding his head, and said, Dear me, what pretty dancing shoes. She was frightened and wanted to throw the red shoes away, but they stuck fast. She tore off her stockings, but the shoes had grown fast to her feet. She danced and was obliged to go on dancing over field and meadow, in rain and sunshine, by night and by day. But by night, it was most horrible. She danced out into the open churchyard, but the dead there did not dance. They had something better to do than that. She wanted to sit down on the pauper's grave where the bitter fern grows, but for her there was neither peace nor rest. And as she danced past the open church door, she saw an angel there in long white robes with wings reaching from his shoulders down to the earth. His face was stern and grave, and in his hand he held a broad, shining sword. Dance you shall, said he. Dance in your red shoes till you are pale and cold, till your skin shrivels up and you are a skeleton. Dance you shall from door to door, and where proud and wicked children live, you shall knock so that they may hear you and fear you. Dance, you shall. Dance. Mercy, cried Karen. But she did not hear what the angel answered, for the shoes carried her through the gate into the fields, along highways and byways, and unceasingly she had to dance. One morning, she danced past a door that she knew well. They were singing a psalm inside, and a coffin was being carried out covered with flowers. Then she knew that she was forsaken by everyone and damned by the angel of God. She danced and was obliged to go on dancing through the dark night. The shoes bore her away over thorns and stumps till she was all torn and bleeding. She danced away over the heath to a lonely little house. Here, she knew, lived the executioner, and she tapped with her finger at the window and said, Come out, come out. I cannot come in, for I must dance. And the executioner said, I don't suppose you know who I am. I strike off the heads of the wicked, and I notice that my axe is tingling to do so. Don't cut off my head, said Karen, for then I could not repent of my sin, but cut off my feet with the red shoes. And then she confessed all her sin, and the executioner struck off her feet with the red shoes. But the shoes danced away with the little feet, across the field into the deep forest. And he carved her a pair of wooden feet and some crutches, and taught her a psalm which is always sung by sinners. She kissed the hand that guided the axe, and went away over the heath. Now I have suffered enough for the red shoes, she said. I will go to church so that people can see me and she went quickly up to the church door. But when she came there, the red shoes were dancing before her, and she was frightened and turned back. During the whole week, she was sad and wept many bitter tears. But when Sunday came again, she said, Now I have suffered and striven enough. I believe I am quite as good as many of those who sit in church and give themselves airs. And so she went boldly on. But she had not got farther than the churchyard gate when she saw the red shoes dancing along before her. Then she became terrified and turned back and repented right heartily of her sin. She went to the parsonage 
and begged that she might be taken into service there. She would be industrious, she said, and do everything that she could. She did not mind about the wages as long as she had a roof over her and was with good people. The pastor's wife had pity on her and took her into service. And she was industrious and thoughtful. She sat quiet and listened when the pastor read aloud from the Bible in the evening. All the children liked her very much, but when they spoke about dress and grandeur and beauty, she would shake her head. On the following Sunday, they all went to church, and she was asked whether she wished to go too. But with tears in her eyes, she looked sadly at her crutches. And then the others went to hear God's word, but she went alone into her little room. This was only large enough to hold the bed and a chair. Here she sat down with her hymn book, and as she was reading it with a pious mind, the wind carried the notes of the organ over to her from the church, and in tears she lifted up her face and said, Oh God, help me. Then the sun shone so brightly, and right before her stood an angel of God in white robes. It was the same one whom she had seen that night at the church door. He no longer carried the sharp sword, but a beautiful green branch full of roses. With this, he touched the ceiling, which rose up very high, and where he had touched it, there shone a golden star. He touched the walls, which opened wide apart, and she saw the organ, which was pealing forth. She saw the pictures of the old pastors and their wives, and the congregation sitting in the polished chairs and singing from their hymn books. The church itself had come to the poor girl in her narrow room, or the room had gone to the church. She sat in the pew with the rest of the pastor's household, and when they had finished the hymn and looked up, they nodded and said, It was right of you to come, Karen. It was mercy, said she. The organ played, and the children's voices in the choir sounded soft and lovely. The bright, warm sunshine streamed through the window into the pew where Karen sat, and her heart became so filled with it, so filled with peace and joy, that it broke. Her soul flew on the sunbeams to heaven, and no one was there who asked after the red shoes. Thank you for listening to A Collection of Fairy Tales by Hans Christian Andersen. If you have enjoyed this audiobook, please consider subscribing and leaving a like to help in the making of future audiobooks.